This is just a wonderful opportunity to determine. That looks like me. <laughs> Why it's important that students attend school. But before I continue with that topic, we would like to thank all of the many partners that we have with the LA County SARB that support us. We'd like to recognize Christy Fry is here today from the District Attorney's Office. And um, you'll be hearing from her shortly. But we have many other partners, the Department of Mental Health, DCFS, probation, law enforcement, and then many community-based organizations as well as all of you that support this most important work. I would like to also mention that, um, as you know, this Wednesday it was a little harder to keep everybody in class, uh, as you know. <laughs> but on behalf of LACO, I would like to commend all of the school districts for your tremendous efforts in providing the opportunity for our students to be able to express their views, to be able to remain safely on campus, and likewise to remember the victims of this terrible tragedy in Florida. So I, we commend all of you for your efforts because I've just heard some wonderful reports out there about what the school districts did. And again, this just helps our students to feel that they indeed have a voice and but that they can do so safely on campus. So thank you. But I wanted to review for you today some of the resources that help to support our school districts and our respective SARBs. But the state of California by statute provides resources from the State School Attendance Review Board or the state SARB. This is led by our colleague from the California Department of Education, David Copperud. And what the state SARB does is they provide guidance. You see a list of statutes there that govern the SARB work. And so the state SAR provides guidance for us when there are changes in the statute. And also, they provide updates and resources related to how we can address lack of attendance and also related behaviors. The state SAR, if you're not familiar with this, they offer a periodic video conference where you can meet with school practitioners related to attendance from throughout the state. So if you're interested in participating in the video conference, please let us know, but it's a great opportunity. Our second resource is we have in Los Angeles County, the Los Angeles County School Attendance Review Board, or SARP, or we know it as the County SARP. In Los Angeles County, because of the size of our county, our SARP does not actually hear cases. But what we do is we delegate the work to 50 local SARPs. So many of you in your school districts participate in a SARP. There are 50 local SARPs throughout the county. And so we have empowered you to do this work. Um, some may say, well, how come there's only 50 SARPs and there's 80 school districts? Well, it's because some of you have consortiums. And so you have several districts that are served by a SARP. But some of the important work that takes place is we have the annual SARB report, which we ask e each of the local SARBs to submit the information to LACO. And then what we do is we compile the data and, and we look at different trends and analyze the data. So the interesting thing on last year's data from 2016 to 2017, we found out that um, when we refer a student to the school attendance review team, or the SART, we had the largest number of students that were referred to SART in our history. There were over 24,000 students referred to SART countywide. But the good news is we found that when you make these referrals, 88% of your students will improve their attendance. So that's tremendous. Um, but what this means is this. It's SART, it's interventions before SART where we see improvement in attendance. And as you know now, we have the California School Dashboard. And coming up next year, we will be responsible for chronic absenteeism. This will be one of the areas that are part of the dashboard. So I submit to you, um, you, might not real, you might not believe this, but I've been at, involved in this work for a long time. Um, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on SARB 20 years ago, 
this is the 20th anniversary of this year. <laughs> um, but the amazing thing, in those days, we didn't have anything called chronic absenteeism. We called it irregular attendance. Well, the same thing, right? But again, the principles that I found 20 years ago are very much the same today. That the efforts that we make before SARD, such as school attendance review team or other efforts, truly make a difference in the lives of our children. The difference now with the dashboard, we're being held more accountable for it. But I know that you've been making these efforts. Um, we're gonna hear later from the Sentinel Valley Union High School District, one of our model SARBs. But I was there a few weeks ago and they said, well, what we do is we look at those who are chronic absentee, and then we assign an administrator or a counselor to find out how they're doing. It's pretty simple, right? I mean, they assign someone to call them in and say, well, how's everything going? I mean, what's going on in your life there? So these small things, I know we all do them, but they do make a difference in the lives of our children because what we're trying to do is to help the disengaged become engaged. And sometimes it's due to academic situations. Sometimes it's due to health reasons, and we'll hear more about that later. Don't forget um, your expanded learning programs are excellent ways to help your students become engaged. Um, you know, I went to one of our schools in Lenox, and at their expanded learning program, they were working out. They were doing hip hop dancing. They were rapping. I said, well, what kind of, this is fantastic. <laughs> I didn't ask to rap though, thank you. But um, I could see how engaged the students were after school. They were excited to be there and it was something that helped them to be more engaged in the regular school day. But um, these are some of the things that we do with the LA County SARB. We have periodic meetings with the SARB chairs where we meet and discuss um, strategies to help. SARB certification, as a member of a SARB, you should participate in this at least every three years. Um, and also, we have an online SARB certification as well for those that um, can't make it out here sometimes. So, so you can do that as well. Well, that is enough. But um, again, welcome. We wish everybody a great day today in our SARB symposium. My colleague, Marian Chiata, leads the county SAR, and we're gonna give you the mic. Mic and the clicker, lucky me. So uh, just like Dr. Um, Thompson had said, we have all of the reports, and what you have in your hands is the truancy toolbox. So this toolbox has all definitions in it, it has reports, it has contacts. So the purpose of it is not only to uh, give you something to gather dust on the shelf, because it will do that, but it also gives you some sample forms and some other things that you can take care of in order to do the best you can for your students. So what I have here is some definitions, and I'm gonna give you the rules of three and five and when things change. Just so you have it in your head, we're gonna practice it. For a truant, it's missing 30 minutes or more. That could be beginning of the day. Parents check them out at the end of the day. A lot of people say, well, how do you call that tardy? Well, they're missing school time. So it's still missing instructional time, beginning of the day or the end of the day. So if you have Aries or Power School or any other programs, make sure you have not only a T30 or something like that for the start of your school day, but also if they're being checked out too early. And that's on three days unexcused. So three strikes, you're out. Three full days or three 30-minute tardies is a truant. When does it become a happy habit? When it becomes five. You got a handful of days already, and that's when you become a habitual truant. You've made a habit of this. So if you've made a habit of it, chronic, Think of it as a chronic illness. It's happening 10% of the time. So in the first 20 days of school, the first month of school, that can be as simple as two days, two out of 20. So when we recommend to our chairpersons, when you're looking at your chronic absenteeism, you're looking at whether they're excused or unexcused. When you're looking at chronic truancy, you're looking at just the unexcused, but it could be as simple as two days a month. Doesn't have to be two consecutive days. There's no rules in that manner. 
But once you get to the end of the school year, 18 days, 10% of 180 school days, is a chronic absentee and that's what's gonna show up on your dashboard. So you really wanna be on top of it early on. Don't wait till it's approaching 15 or 18 days. That's what the district attorneys will talk to you about when you're making and impressing it forward. But to make a difference in the kids' lives, catch it early and talk to them. What's getting in the way? What seems to be the problem? And if it's just the flu, which we've had a, a really rough year this year, so be it, it's not a happy habit. But if it's because they're excusing them or they're coming back with mouse ears or a sunburned nose because they've spent the day at the beach, it's not a red nose from being sick, then you want to watch for those. And if they're taking personal days and parents are enabling it with parent signatures on the, my child was out ill with mouse ears, <laughs> watch out for those things. Two days per school month. I would recommend maybe in the first two days that they're absent or the next month, the second month. If you've got a student that's been absent four days already, they're on the road to chronic absenteeism. And that's when you catch it. Doesn't have to be absence with truancy. It can be excused. So just a helpful hint there. <coughs> These are the real reasons students may be excused. Their absences are here for these reasons. And the newest one is this one here, participation in a US citizenship ceremony. Now, if the student is out for that, for their own citizenship ceremony, it's excused. But let's say, like in my family's case, my husband earned his citizenship. And so I wasn't gonna let my son miss out on that. So we took him to the event. Of course, he's not chronically absent, but the last time I did a presentation, he was tardy to school. And I said, you better not be 30 minutes or more. It was making me crazy. Oh my gosh, but anyway. Um, if you want to allow a student to go to a parent citizenship ceremony or something else, that falls under this category, principal approved justifiable reason. What that's called is administrative discretion. Now, if it's the person at the front desk, the attendance clerk, I'm sorry to say, you don't have the authority to actually make that decision. It has to go as an administrative decision. But if they say so, and you mark it, once you've marked them excused, there's no marking back. You can't change an attendance code once it's entered. If a student is absent and they come in tardy, that's the only time you can change it. But once you've excused it, you can't go back and say, ah, we changed our mind, we're gonna unexcuse them. Okay, so be careful with that. These are the common causes for poor attendance that we hear from in the state of California. This comes directly from the CDE, and I'll, I'll move this way so I'm not always standing in front of the same people. These are the reasons that people say children are staying home. This one is a tough one, caring for a family member. So what we had is we had some creative ideas that came out of that. In one community, they ended up creating, and this is in the uh, Lenox and Inglewood area. Now Lenox is 90304 inside 90301, two and three, so they're kind of a little pocket inside the Inglewood Unified School District but they're close enough that they could work with the other folks in their area. And what they created was a, a co-op, basically. If your child is gonna be out sick, they had an agreement amongst the abuelas, the grandmas, who would be able to watch another child because they're already home. And that way a child wouldn't have to stay home with, for a single parent to watch another child who was out sick. Meaning only the kid who was out sick was home, even if it was a baby and didn't affect us, if our 10-year-old had to stay home to watch it, that child, that child's missing out on instruction. So what you've got to find out in your community when you look at your data, what is it that's causing them to be out sick or marked sick? They could be sick to their stomach because of bullying, that psychosomatic feeling of not wanting to come to school because they're getting picked on. Find out what's going on and then you can put the right means of addressing it, and the right supports for the kids. In LA, we even have more ideas of reasons. This is what's reported. So when we get our annual report, like Dr. Thompson was talking about, we also get some of the reasons. And look at this. Missing or poor-fitting shoes. Can't get to school if they don't have shoes. 
Maybe they're missing glasses. Our school nurses can be of help. Our PTAs can be of help. And sometimes our Title I funds, our homeless funds, our foster youth services, they can all be of help if there's some supplies for just basic needs for our kids. And if that's a reason, hungry or tired should never be a reason because of our free and reduced lunch. But we may hear later from Michelle O'Neill with immigration that people are afraid to fill out forms now because they don't want their name and their address written down because they're afraid ICE is gonna show up. So we've got to hear why is it that the kids are missing and then address it and help them feel that they can trust us and be safe in our environments. So that's the only reason I put them up there, not because there's a bunch of excuses for being out, but those are valid reasons. And those reasons cause the absences, and the absences cause the lack of instruction. Can't teach them if they're not in their seat. Now, it used to be that SARB was looked at as a punishment. You know, if you don't behave yourself, I'm gonna send you to SARB. Finger wag, right? If you don't behave, you're gonna go to SARB and they're gonna take your kids away from you and they're gonna take all your welfare funds from you and they're going to do all these awful things to you and it was all negative. But what we're approaching SARB is in a SART at the school district level. The first approach is even if you send home a letter, you make a phone call. We are letting you know you're getting a letter in, your, in the mail and it identifies your child as a habitual truant. Reason is because they've had unexcused absences. But what we wanna do is turn that around. So what you're going to express to them is not only am I giving you the advisements, because that's the law. Did you know you're breaking the law? But what we wanna do is find out why. What can we do to help you so your child can return to regular attendance? to not be late to school? Is there a carpool need? Is there a transportation need? Whatever it is it's looking into, we're here to help. But we have to send you the letter. Sorry, you're gonna get the ugly letter, but you're getting this phone call because we're here to help. Don't let the letter speak for you. You speak for yourself, the letter speaks for the law. The purpose in punishment is to inflict penalty. It's to tell them what you're doing wrong. Look at that poor kid in the picture. We, you focus on the past. You did this, you did that. I, I know my own kids, I have sons, and I kind of aim toward that, and I've got to change my focus. Because if you're looking at the past, you can't change that. But if you're looking at discipline, you're gonna focus on the future. You want to train them. That's what we do as instruction. We train them, this is what you need to do, and if you need supports, we'll help you do that. Punishment attitude is hostility, frustration, and the result is that you're either gonna act out because they're gonna be obstinate and angry with you, and you'll get those angry aggro parents on the phone. How dare you call my child a truant? Don't you know he was absent? I just didn't send a note. Well, thanks. But if we made the phone call at the beginning, we'd understand better and then advise them, we need our notes right away. But when the child returns, a note would help us understand and know. Without knowing, we just don't know. The result, hopefully, is an attitude of concern and support, and they have knowledge of what to do for future. So we hope that happens. I'm always hopeful, especially in a Friday morning, because the weekend's coming. But I'm also hopeful that if you need supports, we are here for you. And then they don't try to hide it and hope they don't get caught again. Instead, they try to do what's right, because you've made that connection. Here are some uh, uh, offers for Beck's practices, but rather than read aloud to you, I'm gonna let you look at those. And you're gonna hear today from two of our model SARPs, <coughs> Sentinella Valley Union High School District, and then we're also gonna hear from Hacienda La Puente. We are gonna hear from Alhambra as well because they've got something to address the mental health needs of the students. So with all of those things in place, and sometimes it's mental health of the parent, heal the parent, heal the child, right? some of those things will help you keep the accountability there, but also provide the right supports. And what makes sense, and if they're already doing it there, you're gonna see in PBIS, they're doing it at the juvenile court schools. If you can provide positive supports there, you can provide them anywhere. 
So we're hoping today will be really helpful for you. Of, oh, wow, I'm going to take away one great idea, two great ideas, or maybe 10. Let's hope for 10. Dr. Thompson uh, talked about the student attendance reports. Uh, when we write down the report, we're having a bunch of keys and notes. You've got absences. You've got excused absences. You've got unexcused absences. You've got codes. Sometimes, just like in all education, you're filled with acronyms and notations. What's best when you come to the school attendance review team is to talk in parent terms. Your child was sick, this was excused, and this wasn't. Let me tell you why it wasn't. It may have been a really good personal reason, but it doesn't follow the law. And it was under the discretion of our uh, administrator. It's not the front clerk's decision. The administrator looked at it carefully and it determined this was not excused. So we need to help you understand what is and what isn't. What you're doing is you're using your resources, you're discussing the barriers that got in the way, and you're also taking an opportunity to find out what we can do to help the family. Because the bottom line is we want the kids in school. We're not there to fight, but we are there to support. And in that, we may also find the students are struggling. I can tell you my story in second grade Every Friday at 2 o'clock, I had a stomach ache because I couldn't spell worth beans, and that was spelling test time. My mom got onto that one real quick because every Friday at 2, when she got a call from the school nurse, poor little Marion's not feeling good again. She says, it's spelling test. Get her back into class. <laughs> Rats. <laughs> but if there's something they're avoiding, if they're always absent from their math class, if they're always skipping their English class, if they don't go out to PE because they don't want to dress out or they're uncomfortable, there's something happening and look for those patterns because that will also help you to address something they may not want to tell you about. Okay. So here's some things of what to do and what not to do. And I'm going to invite Vicente Bravo up. Are you ready? Is it your turn yet? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Vicente Bravo is my supervisor, so I have to ask him what are good things to do and what are good things not to do, because he's the boss, and if I do things I shouldn't do, he'll let me know. Vicente. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. So there's always the what to do and what not to do. And the reason we bring you the what not to do's is because when you do the what to do, sometimes you show, have people showing up at your doorstep that you don't want showing up at your doorstep. So the idea is to make sure that we do it right the first time and do it in a way that's, uh, that's efficient and that's legally compliant and that's appropriate too, and, and also keeping in mind what's in the best interest of the student. Never wait until it's too late. You know, Don't let things build up and accumulate to the point where now you're trying to figure out what am I going to do for all of them. And we do know that absences can pile up in, in before you know it. In one week, a student can be already, you know, he can develop, become a truant in, in, in that span of time. And we know that, you know, especially taking into consideration some of the things that we're dealing with, when incidents happen, the, this is the kind of thing that sometimes falls to the wayside. But when it does, we then realize that trying to catch up can be a little more difficult in that respect. So you really do have to make sure that you, you, you stay on top of it as best as possible, get a system in place, that gives you the ability to stay on top of it, find resources, use what you have at your disposal. Approving absences without, ex without verification is, you know, sometimes, again, in that rush to do things, we want to go ahead and let, get it done, get it done. But please, make sure that when you're verifying, you have a good system in place, again, that gives you almost like a little checklist that you can go through, that you can see what are the, what are the steps, so you have some form of, of consistency. This should be something that's in place throughout your district. If you're a K-12 district, your elementary, your middle, your high schools, all of your registrars, all of your people who are dealing in the front office, your front office personnel who are dealing with this right off the bat should have a common modality to work off of to determine when uh, something is going to be verified accordingly. When it comes to SARB, don't, it, it, you, know, you don't want to push it if you don't have what you need. SARB is very important, but it's also it's also very specific. You have to make sure that the proper documentation and everything is done and it's in place, especially if it's a very serious case, which may get to our friends at the DA's office. Because then what's going to happen is some people tend to get frustrated, saying, oh, the DA wouldn't take my case. It's not that they wouldn't. It's sometimes they can't because the, the, they have obligations that they have to meet just as we do. 
And if we're gonna proceed with a SAR, we also have to make sure that everything we're doing with every single student is equitably even, that everything is done uniformly. So there is no disparity in terms of how, who, and which cases are taken to SAR. It should be pretty specific, and that documentation needs to be there. Marion already mentioned this, that you know, in, in the past, and, and even today, we still hear it in some places where SARB is seen as a very punitive and a very scare tactic type of situation. We have to be careful that when we're putting forth the recommendations and what we're trying to get our parents to accomplish, that it doesn't come across as a threat. You know, it needs to come across as, as, as something that's very factual and procedural. If this happens, this is one of the possible consequences. You know, we want to get them back in school. That's our ultimate goal, bringing those students back into the fold. But if SARP starts to become a situation where parents start to talk and your, your own people start to talk and put it out there that, oh, you know, they're, they're gonna put you in jail, or they're gonna make you do this, they're gonna make you do that, and they threaten you. Why would a parent wanna show up? Why would they wanna come? So remember that, that as we strive to continue to enhance SARP and to make it a, a, a viable system to help us with our absenteeism, with our truancies, with getting our kids back into the fold. You don't want to let SARP diminish or deteriorate into a situation like that. Every case is unique. We talk about this with all sorts of situations, whether it's student discipline or district permits, whatever it may be. When it comes to student attendance, the same thing. Every case is unique. Just because a student is absent and they're a second grader does not make their situation the same as another second grader who is absent for an illness, for, for multiple illnesses, or whatever it may be. You need to understand and therefore be able to provide the very specific and unique supports that will work with that student and that family. Because unless you really take time to, 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 to listen and understand what the dynamics are, whether it's something as, as, as simple as taking care of a, of a child or something even more intricate is taking care of an, a parent who is ill or who now is to be taken care of at, the ho at home due to a recent medical you know, procedure of some sort. These situations are, you know, take a life on of their own. And we, that's why we build up our resources. That's why we have the different groups of people at the SARTs and the SARBs because they provide different avenues of support that can then help us address this accordingly. Confidentiality. So we all know that records are protected, both locally and through FERPA, that when we deal with this, when you have your SARP panels, your SARP, your SARP panels, that everything that's there is supposed to stay there. When you're looking at what you want to collect, you know, make sure that you have this as current as possible. So that when you do go visit in person, you're showing up at the right place, not some other house that might not be the place it needs to go to. School interventions and incentives are very important, again, to build up, develop, have an array of them. You can, you're not gonna be able to, to, to have this little immediate cookie cutter list that's always gonna work. You're gonna have to get creative sometimes. You may have to combine some resources and some incentives. You may have to create a whole new incentive for a student or for a family where you've encountered a situation that you may never encounter. And as crazy it is, even in this day and age, we still come across situations which are unique different and require us to take a different look at it from what we've already done in the past. All the notes, the sign-in sheets, the participant titles and the agreements need to be clearly delineated, kept, organized, making sure of course that the most important record that you need are the attendance records. Please have some sort of a legend so that, that explains your codes and your, you know, what they are, your markings. Because M might mean something in one district and it might mean something in another district. And that makes life really fun for our friends at the, at the DA's office. And even for some of us, at, uh, in, you know, if you have people from outside agencies coming in, sitting in on your SAR panel, they're trying to, and they may sit on, we have people that sit on multiple panels too. So if they're sitting on one panel over here and they're looking at a certain code, we wanna make sure that they understand what that code means for this district or, or uh, group of districts versus what it means over here. So that legend is very important, making sure that everyone understands what the codes are and if there are any notes accordingly. And last but not least, your IEPs, 504s, and behavior support plans, any plans that are relevant to, to making sure that we're addressing the, the, the student accordingly. In the Ed Code, in, 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 uh, it, we have guidance as to who the composition of the SARP member should be. And you'll see a variety here, you know, which makes it very important. We have parent, 
community members, school districts, school guidance, county superintendent, county probation, county welfare, law enforcement, community-based youth services, child welfare and attendance people, health care, mental health, district attor attorney and public defender. So all of these are the different types of groups. Some of you may even have other individuals that sit on there in addition to what is up here, and there's nothing wrong with that. The more viable resources or people you have there, that's good, as long as they understand the process and they know why they're there. And remember to keep it on that, 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 that goal of you're here because you are gonna help us bring the student back to school. Not because you're here as an additional hammer to, to hammer the family or the kid with. We see you as a viable resource for our families in our community, like the grandmother co-op that Marion mentioned earlier. So with that in mind, you've taken it through here, now we're gonna see what could happen when we don't get the results that we're looking for and where that could lead with Christy. Christy Frey from our uh, deputy in charge, from the, Fry, from the deputy district attorney's office, and uh, she's been awesome, and the information she's given you, please pay very close attention to it. It's very important. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Christy Fry, and I'm the deputy in charge of our ACT program, which is the Abolish Chronic Truancy program, and our Truancy Mediation program. And here with me also is Jennifer Gowan, who I know a lot of you know, <laughs> um, and she does our Truancy Mediations in LA County. So if all of our interventions have failed and SARB and everything else did not work and the student still isn't in school, then the case goes to Jennifer. She'll meet with the SARB chair and the students um, one time for a mediation to see is there anything else we can do and if that doesn't work, then um, we, she's the one who files the cases. So we file cases against parents and against the students themselves depending on whose fault we think the truancies are. Um, so, okay. so some of the basic connections, these numbers I think are uh, really surprising here. Truancy is directly related to uh, dropout rates, obviously if they're truant, um, eventually they often become high school dropouts. Also related to delinquency, meaning committing crimes and ending up in the juvenile delinquent court, uh, substance abuse, and inc incarceration. So if you look at juveniles who were actually incarcerated, put into a juvenile hall, 75% uh, of them had dropped out of school before they were arrested. So I, you know, I feel like the work we do, that all of us in this room do, we save lives sometimes. If we can actually get through to somebody and, and get them back in school and get them back on the right track, the people we're seeing in SARB, for the most part, haven't committed any crimes yet except for skipping school. And if we can make that the only crime they ever committed, um, then we've really honestly saved lives. Um, 25% of juveniles commit felony crimes. Uh, of the felony crimes that were committed, 25% of them were between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. when the kids should have been in school. So these kids that are committing serious crimes, a lot of them are doing it, it wouldn't be happening if they were in school. So we could be saving someone else's life too if we can get these kids back in school. Um, truants are far more likely to spend their lives unemployed, on government assistance, and cycling in and out of the prison system. <coughs> These are um, some numbers from the Census Bureau. These are from 2016. And um, I teach a fifth grade class. I go to uh, once a week and just talk to them for an hour and we do little skits and we uh, do different things. But one of the assignments that I gave them and that we did in class together was they had a budget where they, um, we're told this is how much it costs to have a four bedroom house with a pool, this is how much it costs to have a brand new sports car, this is how much it costs to get to have a bus token, and then we assigned each of them, okay, you're a high school dropout, here's your paycheck. You went to medical school and you're a doctor, here's your paycheck. You graduated from college, here's yours, and they were all based on these numbers from the Census Bureau um, on the mean, income for uh, people over 18. And it's amazing 
the difference in the amount of money you can make. So sometimes that actually works with the kids. I've, I've started bringing up in SARVs sometimes that if you drop out of, of high school, you can see the average annual income of a high school dropout is 26,000, high school graduate 36,000, so about $10,000 difference every single year um, if you just get your diploma. That's the average increase in what you will make. If you graduate from college, it's 30,000 more than graduating from high school. And these are just, just averages across the United States. And um, my fifth grade teacher loved that lesson because even though these kids are only 10 and 11 years old, it hit home with them. The high school dropouts who couldn't afford a car, but the person next to them had a brand new sports car and had money left over to put into savings, it was really, it was really cute. Like some of the some of the kids were saying, "I'm never going to drop out of high school," and the teacher was loving it. So um, that it is just something that you can point out. It, it's, you know, if you don't care about school and you don't know how do you care about money, right? So, <laughs> um, so high school dropouts, sixty percent of them are unemployed one or more times in their lives, and compared to college graduates, that's only four point one percent. High school dropouts between the ages of 16 and 24 have a 63% higher incarceration rate than among college graduates. And juvenile crimes committed by dropouts cost California over a billion dollars a year. And that's according to um, a study done at UC Santa Barbara. It's a group called the California Dropout Research Project. Dropouts compared to a typical high school graduate cost taxpayers $292,000 annually, um, and there are obviously a lot of other related societal issues, incarceration, we get less tax income from these people. Um, and the, the same UC Santa Barbara study showed that high school dropouts um, across California cost us $46.4 billion every year. And um, if you, if you look at the risk triples for men who are high school dropouts, and if you even break it down um, along ethnicity, if by, by age 30 to 34, 14% of white men who were high school dropouts are either dead or in prison or jail. 62% of black men who were high school dropouts are either dead or in prison or jail. So, um, you know, I don't know if these kind of numbers can help your parents understand that it really is important, that education really is important, uh, but they're kind of surprising numbers. So, we, I'm talking about free absenteeism now, meaning when you allow parents to call in and uh, say their kid's sick and you're gonna count it as an excused absence. Obviously, I, I have kids and when my kids are sick, I, they, they aren't chronically absent, so when they're sick, I can call in, and that's an excused absence. And uh, California law allows for the school administrator to excuse an absence within their discretion based on pupil circumstances, um, but you need to remember they're not really free, right? Even excused absences, every time a kid's out, you're losing that ADA money, so that's why free is in quotes. How many absences do you allow before you start demanding notes? And I think, um, I think the, the schools that have had better success with this will say like five to seven. Um, in, you, you kind of have to put a limit on it. I think some of the school districts, the more rich school districts like Manhattan Beach and Palos Springs, I think they, I think it seems like they tend to allow more because they don't want these parents complaining and saying, I told you my kid was sick. What do you mean you're calling it unexcused? But um, it's something that you need to keep in mind because chronic absenteeism does include the excused absences and um, that is something that the state is looking at now. Uh, this is a, a Marion Chiara visual aid here. Uh, she, she mentioned this, um, but once you call it an excused absence, you can't go back and then say, you know what, I'm gonna change all those to unexcused because now I realize this mom was lying when she would call this kid in sick every day. So you have to keep that in mind when you're figuring out how many uh, times you're gonna let a parent call in. And the point of the visual is the toothpaste, you can't get that toothpaste back into the tube. Once it's out, you can't get it back in. So uh, I, li I like that one. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so Saturday school, when I was a kid, Saturday school was a punishment. And I did get Saturday school, I think only once, but I was a very good kid, but I did get Saturday school. Um, and so it used to be kind of thought of as, you know, cleaning up the gum off the sidewalk and things like that. Now we're using it to recover ADA money. And a lot of schools have it. I don't think all schools have it, but these are the requirements for Saturday school if you want to use it to, um, to get some ADA money back and for the students to get some credits that they've missed out on if they're in high school. So does it replace hours of missed instruction? Does it replace opportunity to discuss? Um, and it requires that you have a credentialed teacher teaching the Saturday school in order for it to meet those requirements credit recovery and ADA money recovery. Um, okay, if students aren't in the classroom on time, then they need to check in with the class before coming in. If a parent chooses to remove the, the student from school before the end of the day, then the absence needs to be marked appropriately. So if it's for a doctor's appointment, then that's excused. But um, just this is just a reminder that anytime they miss more than 30 minutes of school and it's unexcused, if they're taking them out early to go to Disneyland, if those accumulate, those are truancies also. And any 30 minutes in the middle of the day, end of the day, beginning of the day, if it's unexcused, it counts towards a truancy. So this is, um, I think you guys, well, at least in the schools know this, but when the letters go out, so after three days of unexcused absences, the notifications go to the parents that have the law in them. And it's usually a letter, it can be verbally delivered, but we in the DA's office like it to be in writing just because if we're going to eventually file a case against the, pe the parent or the student, we need that proof that these things were done. Another day of unexcused absence after that, so just one more day after the three days, you can send the second letter, and at that point, you should be trying to meet with the parent and student in good faith. You can have your SART meetings at this point. And honestly, in LA County, uh, you know, the things I see, they're a lot higher than three days and four days, but this is when you can do it and when you should kind of try to get on top of it before it's 30 days. Um, then, then you only need one more day of unexcused absence. So this is now only five unexcused absences. At that point, you're required to, to put the notification in writing. You're required to send a letter. But at that point, then you can refer the student to SARB. Now, after SARB, if there are even just one additional unexcused absence, you can refer it to mediation. I will tell you, we in our office, just because we're so busy and Jennifer is our sole mediator for all of LA County, all the way up to Antelope Valley and Pomona and Redondo Beach, um, usually we'll look for, for maybe three more unexcused absences after SARB before we take it. But um, yeah, and, and a total of 15 unexcused absences before we take it. So the law allows us to do it sooner than that, but that's kind of what we're, we're trying to uh, address the worst students that we have in the county, and we have plenty of them with more than 15, and so that's who we're kind of trying to target and spend our time on. After truancy mediation, if there are continued unexcused absences, that's when Jennifer will file a case against them if we have enough proof and if we, if we think there's just nothing else that we can do. Um, and, and obviously along the way, we're offering services uh, the whole time. The key attendance players are the district school boards. Those people are important in deciding how many times are you gonna let a parent call in sick. They should be setting uh, rules as to how many free days that will allow parents to call in. The attendant specialists, like the PSA counselors and people like that, are important. And then the actual front room clerks are the face-to-face -face people, the people who can really intervene with the kids. And so, you know, I have, it's, you know, even with my kids going through school, some of those people are really sweet and, and are very, um, you know, actually wanting to just excuse the absence themselves or excuse the tardy and write a note. And uh, that doesn't always help us out if you're, if you're making excuses for the kids. But some of them I've seen do things like we've got a kid who's been absent over and over and over again, 
they went to Sarb, and now they're like, okay, I'm, I'm scared, I don't wanna go to the DA's office, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go. And then the attendance clerk will say to them, oh, it's nice to see you today, good, good, good to see you decided to show up today. And that's just not, you know, like, please, try, try to encourage them, try to, um, you know, that they are there, they don't wanna be there, but let's, let's try to make school a more pleasant experience. Um, okay, so local law enforcement can give out truancy tickets. Um, uh, on the SAR process side, it's an education code violation. It's for unexcused absences, and as I mentioned, you can refer to prosecutors if um, there's enough uh, unexcused absences. But local law enforcement can also write tickets, and that's based on local ordinances, so a Compton ordinance or a Torrance ordinance and um, probation handles those tickets that are written by law enforcement. So those never actually come to our office, those never actually go to juvenile court. So they go through probation and hopefully a probation officer can try to get the kid back in line, but that is another way that uh, truancies are dealt with that does not deal with the district attorney's office. Yes, so this is, we're gonna play a video. them and it make they makes each one of them feel special and um, these are the kind of things that you know you, I don't know you don't learn when you go to school but just the kind of people skills things anything you can do to make the kids want to come to school like Victor was talking about the hip-hop classes and things that they look forward to um, is is great I would like to introduce to you our speaker dr. Laurel bear from the Alhambra Unified School District and Alhambra was a model SARP this past year, and she will be discussing the Gateway to Success program. This is an award-winning <coughs> mental health project that received the Golden Bell Award from the California School Boards Association a few years ago. So we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Laurel Bear. So good morning and thank you for allowing me to spend a little bit of time with you. Some of you may have heard the story and the journey that we have taken in Alhambra with the Gateway to Success program, but we really attribute our increase in improved attendance, our decrease in behavior, our decrease in suspensions and expulsions, our student engagement, our student re-engagement, our parent engagement, our school climate, all as part of Gateway to Success. So, it was quite a journey. We just celebrated a decade with Gateway. So we began this journey about 15 years ago, really piloting and looking at what would bring kids to school. And I love some of the information that was shared this morning because it's more than just instruction. And what we always say to our staff and to our parents is that we are the most important, influential people in our children's life. And every child deserves at least one adult. We know they need far more adults, but at least one adult. And so we need to make sure that we understand that kids may not always remember what we teach them. They're gonna remember those handshakes, absolutely. But they'll always remember how we make them feel. And they're gonna come back to places where they feel welcomed, where they feel wanted. And so when we began to look at even something as simple, well, that's a hideous picture. Um, that's from our critical incident training. Even when we see something um, as simple as a school-based mental health project, we have to look at how do we do things differently. And so 10, 12, 15 years ago, we didn't talk much about school mental health. 
there's so much a stigma associated with mental health and so we had to begin to look at how do we message this and so we work across the country and we train not only school officials but I was back in Washington this summer working with school resource officers it is an absolute team approach we have to step away from working in silos like we often do in education and look at we increase collaboration we increase capacity because we can't do it alone when you look at the statistics are staggering and our kids are coming to school far more trauma exposed our kids are coming to school with far more mental health conditions and if we're going to stabilize them so they maximize their academic performance we've got to do it at school School is the most logical place because it's the most static place in many of our kids' lives. It's the most functional place in many of our kids' lives. So as we look at this, we need to recognize we all have a hand. From that front office attendee, to the principal, to the assistant principal, to the board of education. And so when we went back about 15 years ago and I said to the district, we need to create a suicide board policy, they looked at me like I was nuts that's not going to change behavior and that was well before assembly bill and I said yes but it leverages the opportunity to educate because if our board policy and the administrative regs say that every year we are going to train our staff as a required board policy on these different areas we know we do that annually so look at what you have in your community we're always encouraging communities and see what you do best and you know I always look at a horrific incident such as a tragedy in Florida and how are we going to leverage that for change because otherwise if we sit around and say that was tragic and we don't do things differently nothing will change and so really that has been the mission of Gateway we're not hundred percent perfect but we really work hard at having this right some of our statistics are staggering one in five children come to school with a mental health condition diagnosed or undiagnosed and if we looked at education five years ago, 10 years ago, 38 years ago when I began this journey, we would have never even talked about mental health. We didn't really know much about mental health and we know our kids are coming to school far more involved. And we know that one out of every four kindergartners come to school trauma exposed. And we know how much trauma impacts learning. And so we're co so quick to put a label on that that we have to look at how do we do business differently because if we address every child as if they matter, they're gonna to wanna to be somewhere where they matter. We had a huge foster care symposium this year, thanks to LACO helping sponsor some of that at ELAC. And I remember standing in front of our foster youth and our homeless youth, and we don't call them that. We call them our hope children and our star children. And I remember saying, we're here to celebrate you. That's a pretty simple sentence, and I didn't give it much thought, it was just the truth. And this little girl at the end of the symposium, and they left, it looked like Oprah Winfrey. We had so many donations that they were leaving with bags and book bags of items and gift cards. And this little girl came up to me and says, no one has ever celebrated me. And so I stepped back and, you know, 38 years, you don't often hear messages like that. And I thought if every day we make one difference in the life of a child, that's huge. That's monumental. And kids will come back to learn. And we know that our schools are so trauma exposed. And we know just with what we've experienced in Florida and what we were able to capitalize this week and looking at how do we begin to talk about care and an empathy and kindness because kids don't just acquire that, they learn that. And when you look at the role models of some of our kids, they don't have those stable functional role models. And so we have to look at we are it. Um, whether we signed up for that or not, we are it. So we know our kids come to school trauma exposed. And so how do we begin to talk about mental health? You've got to message it in your community. So we know there's going to be mental health money coming down and many of you may be dabbling in some school-based mental health and many of your unions and teachers are probably saying, but we don't want those kids pulled out of class because they're already doing poorly in those classes. But what we're say saying to them is if we can help stabilize if we can help teach them how to cope and manage and compensate the traumas they've been exposed to and begin to treat that, they will be more apt to learn and they will be more apt to graduate and they will be more apt to go on to higher education. Because kids that are worried about where their next meal is coming from or who's gonna beat them in the evening or where they're gonna live the next day, they're not focusing on, no matter how great of instructors they are, they're not focusing on learning. They're focusing on surviving. And so we have to really begin to look at education differently. In LCAP, if I had a crystal ball 10 or 12 years ago, I could not have predicted anything that aligned so closely with Gateway as LCAP. 
It requires a climate survey. We've conducted local climate surveys in our district for the last 12 years, and we've created our own. It requires student engagement. That was part of our Gateway to Success plan. It required parent components, and you'll see that we had numerous parent activities and opportunities. It requires safe schools and inviting those police officers and those local agencies on our campuses daily, not just when something happens, so that we begin to really develop those integrated relationships and that we cross-train so when we're conducting a suicide assessment, our officers are standing right next to us. Or if we can't get PMRT and we're having to transport a child to be placed on a hold, an administrator transports with the police department so that kids don't misconstrue that and think they're being arrested or they've committed a crime. So it's really thinking outside the box, and your communities have this. It costs no more. It's just looking at are we willing to take a risk as a community. And so I said to you when I went to the district um, board several years ago, back about 12 or 15 years ago, and said we needed this suicide policy, I needed to talk about the elephant in the room. And so some of your communities may not be ready to talk about that. And so it's how you message that. You message that by saying, how do we increase attendance? How do we increase graduation rates? How do we decrease discipline rates, suspensions, and truancies? How do we create that universal treatment of care, that early intervention treatment of care, that intensive treatment of care? It's finding what works within your community. And our demographics are no different than yours. And the highest responders are our API community, but that took a lot of work to have our Asian Pacific Islanders recognize the value of mental health and accept those services. So we make sure we look at those cultural competencies and that we're really integrated and that those service providers really mirror our community. In August this year, we had a huge kickoff for the school year and we had a mental health day on a Saturday. And it was suicide prevention. We thought, what a perfect opportunity. We used to kind of mask it by how to keep your kids safe and we never mentioned the word suicide or mental health. That's why we don't call it the Alhambra School District Mental Health Project, we call it Gateway to Success, because that's hard to dispute. It was standing room only in August on a Saturday before school started. Parents want this information, kids want this information, they're just afraid to ask. And if we don't make it a climate of care and begin to talk about the value and importance of good mental health, they're not gonna talk about it because there's so much stigma associated with mental health. So we have to look at that and be able to differentiate that. Mental health is needed in school for all these reasons. And we all have that. We have our unaccompanied youth. We have our homeless youth. We have our foster youth. We have our chronic non-attenders. We have our truant youth. We have our kids that are transient and go to 11 different districts in two years, or perhaps one year. So we know that we need to address our children's mental health. And we know that our kids come to school far different than they did before. And what we say to our teachers when we provide trainings is, don't just look at what's in the book bag. Look at what they're bringing along with them within that book bag. Because their book bags look very different. And so if they don't have those coping skills and management skills and resiliency skills and protective factors, they're very at risk. And so what we really message in our community is, how do we increase those protective factors and decrease those risk factors? You do that when you're assessing for suicide, right? You're looking at, do those protective factors outweigh those risk factors? You do that when kids aren't coming to school. We look at attendance as a symptom. And so SARB is one of those interventions. It's a treatment plan. And we try all other means, but if we're not successful, if there's not a follow through on that contract, then we're gonna look at, okay, our SARB board, if you looked at it, it looks like the best put together DMH board because it's mostly DMH workers and social workers. And certainly we have our school resource officers and all those other individuals, but we're looking at how do we design the most comprehensive treatment plan there is. Because even if we file with the district attorney, it doesn't change behavior, just like when we suspend, it doesn't change behavior. And then everybody's surprised when the child comes back in a worse place than when they left us. So we have to look at how we're gonna address kids differently. So it's kind of one of our favorite messages. You see banners all over our campuses, um, and so we do a lot of messaging with that. On Fridays, you see every kid wearing Gateway T-shirts because that's good messaging for mental health. When we've done surveys, because we do a lot of research with our different projects, and uh, UCLA is one of our biggest partners, and we say to kids, do you receive mental health services? And they say no, and we know they do because we track every single referral. 
the day that the tr that referral is made all the way to the linkage to the termination. We know the cause of the referral because it's rich, great data that we can do business differently. And then when we come back around to that child and say, do you receive gateway services? Oh yeah, I receive gateway services, not mental health services. So there's no correlation. We've really been able to destigmatize. So messaging it is extremely important as you mes message what your goals are. Working to approve school attendance, it's no secret. There's no magic bullet. It's creating a climate of care. It's making sure those kids have those reliable adults. It's making school a welcome place. And so real simple things that we talked about, standing at that door, greeting kids. We say to our staff, dig really deep to find a compliment, but find that one compliment for the day. Because kids need to have those positive strokes. We don't want to go to a workplace where we're not receiving positive strokes. We have to look at that the same way for our children. And so when we train our staff, we train our staff on all these variables. So we do have the attendance training, but we talk about how do you greet families? How do you call home and say, school is not the same today without you being at school? Is there something we can do to assist you getting to school rather than just reporting your absence today? What is the cost for your absence? So we're really looking at how we message differently. And we don't always get it right, but we will come back and correct that. Because we want to make sure, especially in today's climate, that school is a safe place. And parents rely on us, and parents trust us so that they're going to fill out those free and reduced lunch forms. And they're going to go to those parent universities in the evening. And because a lot of communities are saying parents aren't going out in the evening, they're afraid. And so we did a huge parent university two weeks ago, and we had the police chief talking about we are really protecting our families. And he is an immigrant, so he was able to really talk about that standing room only at our parent universities, and that's in the evening. At our parent projects, we've got standing room only. In fact, we've got stand-up sign-in sheets for the summer already. At our Saturday schools, we don't collect ADA, but we require parents to attend with their children. And so it's a real interesting philosophy, but we've been doing that for the last many years because this way we can have clinicians working with the kids in one area, and then we have admin administrators working with parents in another, and we bring in clinicians there. So it's really being able to message all of those valuable resources. So our pyramid looks like everybody else's pyramid. But what we have to help you decide and what we've decided is, what is our goals? And one of our primary goals, and we'll say this all the time, is that we need to make sure and ensure a safe campus. And we know that good mental health helps to ensure a safer campus. And our kids tell us that. And our climate survey tells us that. And the research that we've done tells us that. Because what we saw 10 years ago is a huge disproportionality with referrals. And they mirrored the special ed referrals, and they mirrored the school to prison referrals, and they mirrored the expulsion referrals. It, were, it was our minority students that were being referred for services. Because they externalized the behavior more than some of our other ethnic um, minority groups. And so we began to look at how are we going to close that gap too? How are we going to ensure that we're not waiting for a child to literally fall off the cliff before we identify risk factors? And so we do a lot of training with that. A lot of universal training. So our rules assemblies, kids know what not to bring to school. It's in our parent student handbook. It's plastered all over the education code and all over our website. But our rules assembly talks about care and empathy, how to take care of kids, how to refer yourself or a friend if you're concerned about a friend. Last year, we had about 175 transports and holds. And that's not the number of assessments. That's just transports and holds. Of the 175, over 2 thirds were kids referring peers that they were concerned about. That's your climate survey right there. You don't have to disseminate a survey to know that kids trust adults. And until kids trust adults, they're not going to share with adults. And so we have to really develop that. And that has to be a constant messaging where we model that we're able to demonstrate that, and kids trust that we are going to listen to what they have to say. On the shoes. So what we did is, um, there are a lot of um, that of boys, and there are a lot of great messages on shoes. And you know, we talk a lot. We've got the faith community very much invested and involved. 
Um, they do a lot of donations, and so they, they did a whole project on all of these different areas. And so, you know, I'm going to college. We've got a lot of opportunities with foundations where they've stepped in and wanted to be a part of Gateway. And so it's nice when they're knocking on your door and you're not having to go seek out those different resources and funding. So a lot of it comes from that. If you look at our system of support, it probably looks no different than many of your systems of support. Uh, we have a very comprehensive suicide prevention protocol well before the assembly bill. The assembly bill is wonderful, but what we're seeing is that you, know, you have to be careful what you wish for. Once you educate, then what do you do when those referrals start coming in, particularly in a matter that's so complicated. So I was up in Sacramento the last three days, and districts are really struggling because they're now educating teachers you know, as the watchdogs and making sure they identify risk factors, but they don't have the infrastructure to treat kids that need help. And so we have to really look at what are the resources within your community. We have a very comprehensive threat assessment protocol, and we've had that for about the last 10 years. You can only imagine on the heels of such a horrific incident how those numbers go up. And we work very closely with Department of Mental Health start team, and we have for many, many years. And they said that they are so overwhelmed that they're triaging right now. And we know that if we've done a transport and gone to look for a bed, there's no pediatric beds available all in LA County. And then you go to county hospital and, and it looks like a war zone. They're literally triaging these kids as young as second grade out in the hallways. So we have to build those protective factors with the kids. We have to help kids be able to manage and cope and deregulate and deescalate. So we've done a lot of mindfulness work. And we're just getting ready to publish some of our mindfulness work with Fuller and UCLA. And what we have seen is it really works. Teaching kids how to not be so impulsive, to be able to step back and breathe, to be able to regulate, all those things that we think kids come to school equipped to do, they don't. Our kindergartners are not even coming to school these days knowing how to take terms and share. So they're not going to be able to deregulate on their own because we look at one out of every four kids come to school trauma exposed. Who are their role models? Is that environment suited to be able to help them and teach them how to manage? And then we look at our crisis response team. We have a very, very comprehensive crisis response team. But what's nice is we have school-based services, and so we cross-train. So all those agencies that come and deliver services in your schools, have them come be a part of your crisis response training. Now you've doubled or tripled your capacity of service. So if there is a need to activate a crisis response team, certainly we have 70 plus crisis responders in the district, but that means we have to pull the psychologists out of IEPs and the counselors away from you know, doing what they need to do and the administrators. If we've cross-trained, we use all those local agencies and they'll literally call and say, Laurel, where do you need us? How many clinicians do you need? And so we are able to access all those service providers so it increases that capacity of care. And all of you have that availability as well. And what it does is it keeps kids in school. Because 11 or 12 years ago, we didn't get referrals. I was so happy to have referrals. We may have had 100, if we were lucky, referrals. And we were beating down the drawers for teachers to make referrals and law enforcement to make referrals and parents to make referrals and kids to make referrals. Now we average about 2,000 services a year, school-based services alone. And it really costs the district barely nothing because those mental health agencies come in, do they not? And you've got their clients, they are our students. And if they're Medi-Cal, they're able to serve them. And then we have MOUs with about nine or 10 local universities and we have over 100 interns in our clinical intern academy. They can service anybody, uninsured, underinsured, they're highly trained, we do provide that external supervision. So through LCAP we're able to do that, but look at the way you can increase capacity. So there are absolute ways that you can do that, that for a very small amount, you maximize your resources. And even through the darkest times, well before LCAP, we sustained Gateway in our district because it became a priority. You know, you have student services. Our board saw a vision about eight years ago where they created the Student Employee Welfare Division. And that's where I serve as the assistant superintendent. So that's an unusual name, but we saw such great outcomes with students that we offer additional support for our teacher teaching staff and our classified staff. Because we know if they're in a good place, our kids are gonna be in a better place. And so we have to look at that as well. 
And so mental health is very much integrated into the system. We have a gateway office at our police department. We cross train and collaborate. We run a number of parenting classes at our police departments. Um, we work very closely. So as we were gearing up for the walkout this week, you know, we did a lot of preparing and training and the messaging was all over because we wanna support kids because that supports safe schools. And so kids know that we're in it together and we're collaborating. And then we do a number of parent and teacher wellness series. So there are a lot of wellness because Teachers are apprehensive oftentimes to permit kids to leave class to go receive mental health services. They don't understand what mental health is all about. Or they come with their own associated stigma. So in the afternoons, we started wellness didactic series for our teachers. And teachers came to see what it was all about, but now it's standing room only. They have to register the, the month before to even get in. And what we talk about is how does mental health present itself in the classroom? What really happens in therapy? How do I engage in my own self-care? Because if our kids are stressed, so are our staff. And so we have to look at how do we do a better job with self-care? What we did is we reached out to our local YMCA and said, would you allow our staff to come and register at the Y? And they said, we'll do it even better. They can have a full year of free registration at the Y if they work in the Alhambra School District. Part-time, full-time, hourly, and they've continued that for the last four years. They pay a one-time registration fee of $30 and they get the entire year full access to the YMCA. That just took a relationship and a phone call. So we share that with you because you have many resources and perhaps even more resources that you can reach out to. If we look at referrals, something that we always suggest is you have a systematic approach. Because when we began referrals 15 years ago, the referral would go to the nurse or to the yard duty aide or to the campus supervisor, or to the assistant principal, and then we were afraid referrals would drop through the cracks. Now we have a very systematic approach. Every year at the start of the year, at the welcome back and at the BITSA program and new teacher orientation and at every staff meeting, we go online and we show them exactly how to generate a referral. And then we noticed through our tracking and through our research that our referrals of kids referring themselves had declined. Well, kids aren't gonna go online and generate a referral, they need a barcode. So on our campuses now, we have posters where they can barcode their own referrals. And we need to make sure that whatever we're offering, it aligns with what kids are gonna access. Just like hotlines, they use text messaging, we need to do the same as well. So really look at those innovative approaches and the kids helped us design that because we did a lot of satisfaction measures and surveys there. So we need to know what's on a referral. We have referrals for every reason, but probably mood is the strongest indicator, and it's hard to ascertain and find a, a student, particularly a teenager, that's not moody. But when there's something that looks different, chances are there's a cause for that difference. And so we look at that. Absenteeism is part of that, so we looked at our absenteeism rate when we started this about 12 years ago, and so we've really built on that. In Saturday school, although we don't collect ADA, we have a couple hundred kids every Saturday, along with our unhappy parents on Saturdays as well. But what we have found is that we make that referral, and now we have our frequent visitors every Saturday, because they say it's the first time I can sit and not argue with my teenager. It's the first time that I can have a healthy dialogue that I'm actually taking tools and I'm applying those tools and guess what, they're working. Or some of them have created support groups over the years because it's kind of a place where they feel they're not alone. And so there's a lot of advantages with that. Kids don't necessarily come unless they're assigned, but the parents do come if they're not assigned. And then we track all of our referrals. So we have a completely separate data bank and all of our gateway referrals are HIPAA aligned. So if you have any interest in it, down to the font size, because we want to make sure that they meet medical eligibility and that perhaps one day they will bill back. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but we have considered that as well um, to um, DMH and to Medi-Cal. So we're looking at all that as well. But you can look at our referrals online if you go onto the Gateway website. So why does your district need it? Probably the same reason we needed it. We need to make sure kids are engaged in school. We need to make sure kids are healthy and safe. We need to make sure and ensure that our schools are safe environments. We need to provide the services that our kids need. We know that if kids need mental health services, that the earlier we treat them, the more successful that treatment plan is. We know that if there are barriers where they have to drive to a clinic, even if that clinic is three miles away, they're most likely not gonna get there. They can't get to school and it's the same time and same place every day. They're not gonna get to a clinic once a week. 
So we know there is a lot of barriers, and so we have to look at how do we begin to reduce those barriers. And the best place to reduce those barriers are at your school site. And so that's what we've been able to do and been able to accommodate and work. And we know we've done it right when school staff don't know the difference between the clinicians on campus, the interns on campus, and the full um, paid staff on campus. Then you know it's a true integration process. We also have special attention with our Hope Kids, our Star Kids. Those are our kids that um, are McKinney Vento kids. Those are our kids that are foster youth, our probationary kids, our unaccompanied kids, our refugee kids. We have gateway counselors assigned specifically to those clientele, and we go above and beyond with a number of different activities. But I think most importantly, and what has been really creative, is that our faith community has really rallied behind. And through our Medi-Cal funding, we've been able to hire three social workers that attend directly to our adults of our homeless families. And so they're able to help stabilize those families and secure permanent and fixed housing because we know if the adults in their lives are stabilized, kids are gonna be far more stabilized. So we just looked at our data so far this year and we've been able to find permanent and fixed housing with our kids for about 22 families. And that adds, adds up to about 48 kids that otherwise would have been living on their cars, living in the hotel, living in shelters. And so we have really looked at an innovative way. So if you're securing LEA funding and you go to your LEA funders, they may be able to fund something like this. And now they've gone ahead and approved that funding for the next three years, so we're not having to go back and beg. And so what we look at is those three social workers work directly in our division. And we have to get a release because we can't share information, but once that release is secured, they're attending to the work of the adults while we're attending to the work of the kids. And as a result of this, this is permeated into the community where now there's a huge homeless consortium that we're really looking at how do we do the things differently. And we're able to do food banks every month and we're able to do back to school celebrations and our faith community created hope bags. So during those difficult times when we're on break or on the weekends, they create these bags of survival and we call them hope bags. And they provide thousands and thousands of hope bags for our families. Again, costs no money to your districts. It's just looking at how do we think outside the box. And then school climate is critically important because kids are not going to come to a place they don't feel safe. And so we know the advantages of that, and we don't need to get into that. So we do a lot of prevention. So although we do have contraband canines, that's there for education. And our canines do a lot of education in the evening at our parent universities and at our Saturday schools and at our school sites because we know it does not change behavior unless we change the climate of that behavior. And parent engagement, probably the biggest piece. So if you leave today with nothing else from what I've shared with you, get your parents involved at every level because oftentimes we say those are the parents that want nothing to do with us. But I have to tell you, for the last nine years, I run parent project classes every Thursday night at the police department. And it's quite a journey. It's a 10-week program, and they're ordered there. They're directed there through SAR, perhaps, through a district behavioral contract, perhaps through an expulsion, depending on the circumstances, sometimes through the court. And they come the first night, and they want nothing to do with you, and they want nothing to do with the class. And by the end of 10 weeks, we'll have a graduation next Thursday there's tears and celebrations and they formed relationships and not only are they doing better, but their kids are doing better. And so we have some parents that have literally come back around three and four 10 week series. And it's gotten so big that we run it summer as well. And why we do it at the police station, it sends a really important message. We don't wanna just say we collaborate with the department, we need to visually be able to see that we truly do collaborate with the, the department. And in addition to that, we have police officers that participate in parent project classes. So every facilitator facilitates with a police officer for the 10 weeks. And it's the same facilitator and police officer for the entire 10 weeks. If you can't establish a relationship after 10 weeks, two hours, once a week in the evening, nothing will work. And so they may come there as a result of an order, they leave there different people. And more importantly, they leave there wanting to become engaged and better engaged in their child's environment. So I know it's the parents that many of us don't want to deal with or we know how exhausting it is to deal with. But remember, every parent wants their child to be successful. They just not, may not be equipped with the tools and skills to get them there. So working with parents, however we do it, building rapports, sending out messages, we encourage at least five positive messages a week from our staff. Our counselors will do the same. 
really being able to work together as a collaborative. You know, we do a lot of Saturday programs on our food bank once a month. We do haircuts at the food bank because the local beauty school came and said, we can do this, we need ours. So it's really looking at those variables. The end of the month on a Saturday, if you want to see something magical, come to Alhambra High School. And we have the Sushi Foundation that brings in all the produce from the fields. So it's literally from farm to table and it costs the district nothing other than providing a facility and getting clearance as a food bank. Now obviously there's a lot of behind the work, but we know that kids come to school hungry, they're not going to learn. So it's another way to re-engage our kids into the community. So a decade of service I just wanted to take you through. We started very young and very small. I think we had one intern on our campus. Now we have over 100. It's match day today. So I know that my intern team is waiting to see which interns are going to be matched to our school site. It's very competitive. We run a very hard program, but we know it's right because we see many of our hundreds of interns that we've been able to bring through our district back working with DMH and back working with the local agencies and being our PMRT providers. And so we know that it is truly working. We have multiple MOUs with school districts um, and with universities. We sit on a number of boards with them. We want to make sure that we message that we value good mental health. Our mental health agencies as your agencies are probably no different. We're tapping into the same resources, but you know what? We will never run out of clients for those agencies, so it's not competitive at all. So we're more than happy to share with you any of the agencies we use or the MOUs we use because we train lots of our agencies. And so we want to make sure we're able to provide that to you. So I'd like to, to just give you a snapshot. And so there's a video that we're going to see if we can boot up. But I want you to just look at all the activities because Gateway is not just <coughs> um, Gateway is not just a one-time project. It really encompasses the entire school district. And so everything from the messaging to being out on campus, we have our um, intervention advisors that just do attendance. That was our continuation school. We, had, um, we wanted to make sure that our kids met solid working men in the community so they were greeted by all of these men one day. It was a little overwhelming for them, but they really enjoyed that. You can see how we promote a lot of healthy activities. Yes. <laughs> a lot of assemblies. Our police department now offers a great program. It's a wonderful evidence-based program. It really teaches those kids how to make sound, solid decisions. We do a lot of classwork, so we're able to do a lot of assemblies and classwork, and you're gonna see our partners are pretty consistent. From our therapists, to our interns, to our police department, and we're actually in the classrooms. And then a lot of messaging out on campus as well, because you, you have to plaster it everywhere. So each month we have a different theme and we make sure that we're out there and those are all the gateway shirts and there's all different colors running around our school district and our community. So as you begin to take inventory of what your school community does, I'm hoping that you're able to take some of this information back to your community. You're welcome to go on to the Gateway website, and so we can click it and go to the next one. You're welcome to go on to the Gateway website because truly all of us have a hand. So when we say it's just the attendance clerk's responsibility to call home or just the administrator to go ahead and fill the packet out and send them to her, uh, SAR, that's not the case. We really need to make sure that we are very comprehensive in our approach. Certainly you can email me, and I thank you for this opportunity this morning. Well, Dr. Bear, before you leave, we would like to again thank you for your exemplary work over all these years. And I know that many families and students have benefited from your tremendous efforts. And on behalf of the Los Angeles County School Tennis Review Board, we have a small, probably a tiny token of appreciation <laughs> for all that you do. But, but thank you. Isn't that fabulous? Oh, I tell you, and just moving from one thing to the next. So we hear that our students need to be well supported, whether it's mental health or what have you. A little backstory on Lonnie. She's from Roland Unified School District. And so Lonnie came to our studio, and she came with her cousin. Her mother's passed away, 
because her father did something awful. Her father is incarcerated. So given that trauma, just like what was shared earlier, she came to school when she could. She took care of her brothers, her sisters, when she could. Otherwise, she couldn't care for herself sometimes. And Lonnie, when she moved in with her cousins, ended up going to school every day and on time because they made a difference in her life. But she still attended SARB because regardless of what school you're going to, your record follows you. So I want you to look at this video for Lonnie. During my sophomore and junior year, I fell off in terms of my attendance and my grades, and I had a hard time going back into that pattern because um, uh, both how far I lived and my own motivation. Uh, two or three weeks before I got my SAR letter say, stating that I needed a meeting, um, I moved back in with my cousins. So when we got the letter, we were really surprised at the fact that we did have to go to a meeting because in the days before we had um, fixed our attendance and started going more often, tried to right our wrongs. Um, during the meeting, they talked about how we needed to improve our grades. They presented to us our absences, truancies, um, tardies, and the big effect that it had on our school and career. Uh, they told us that with all the problems we were facing, that we were kind of putting ourselves in jeopardy rather than anyone else. And it really helped us to get back on track. After that, my cousins were a huge support system. They helped um, me and my sister both to keep going. They pushed us. They made us go to school every day. We had to do our homework, all that stuff. And eventually, we did get back on track. And throughout my senior, my senior year and summer that I am studying college, they've been there and they've been helping me, um, guiding me in the direction I need to to finish my education and do what I want to do. Um, the SAR meeting helped me to not only understand that I can still fix the things that I've done wrong, but that I can, I can change everything that's happened, even though it has been wrong in the past. Um, they pushed me to also understand that even though I, I have done wrong, I can still do right. And yeah, uh, this fall I'm going to be attending Cal Poly Pomona, which is a four-year university, and hopefully I can push through and do what I want to do. And in terms of SARB, they helped me to understand that I have a choice and because of that choice, I've bettered my future and a lot of other people can. Lonnie stopped midway in filming. I think something hit her and I was sitting with her cousin in the green room watching and she just broke down into tears and just stood there staring at the camera because it brought up all those old emotions. It never goes away. But she's learned the coping skills and the supports that she got through SARB and through her cousins is what made a huge difference in her life. I want to kind of empower you to do that as well. I'd like to begin this portion of our program by introducing my colleague Susan Chaidez. Susan is the project director for our Community Health and Safe Schools Unit and Susan is a registered nurse, and she has a background as a school administrator as well as a school nurse. But recently we learned that Susan was named the California Nurse Administrator of the Year. So we'd just like to congratulate her. Okay, well thank you for that introduction. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about absences and health concerns. Um, I have this little cartoon here that he's giving. He says, here's my absence note. I had spring fever. Um, so what can we be looking at and stuff? So a lot of um, chronic health issues that may come to uh, have a lot of issues that come in. So we're talking about do students have access to care? Uh, do they have chronic health problems, acute illness, communicable diseases, immunizations, and other health problems? And so we're going to be talking about some of these things as well as we go through today, but there's lots of health concerns. Um, so some of the red flags um, we want to look at, that uh, need to be looked at, at more, is looking at if student is uh, frequently tardy or leaves early. So sometimes it might be that uh, the student may have some 
undiagnosed health issues that the student that no one has really looked into. Um, there have been cases where, for example, a student who has stomach issues or some some bowel problems uh, would leave every day, in or most often, many times a week, in the afternoon would leave early to go home and not necessarily always going through the health office, but getting signed out. And so again, is there somebody that's looking at patterns of how kids are, how often they're coming in tardy, how often they're leaving school early, to look at so someone can actually say, hey, is something going on? Is there a trend? Is there some undiagnosed? Or maybe it's diagnosed and they haven't shared the information with school. But most often if it's something that's not diagnosed, they're just dealing with, their parent just says, well, they have an issue with this or they're nausea and vomited, you know, nausea and have vomiting in the morning, um, and then once their stomach settles, then they're able to go to school, or they're not sleeping um, in well, and so by the time that they finally fall asleep, way, you know, three, four in the morning, they haven't had an adequate amount of sleep to get to school, and so again, these can just be red flags of what we're looking at, what are some patterns that are happening. Um, is a student having excessive excused absences? So what kind of things might you be seeing with students have having an excused absence that are related to medical? Doctors, doctor's visits, okay. Or frequently the student is sick, but maybe they're sick a lot, or they're being, it's so a parent writes an excuse, which is fine, but now we're starting to add up on those absences and looking at, so when we're talking again about chronic absent, absenteeism, we're looking at is it 10% or 18 days. So if we're starting to see some patterns of uh, missing parts of school day or being absent a lot, and they all seem like plausible reasons that, that they are excused, we do need to have to look into it a little bit more um, so we can figure out what's going on and how can we support them at school. Um, most students who have a chronic health issue, such as asthma or diabetes or something, or seizures, they don't tend to miss a lot of school. So just because someone says, well, my child has asthma, that's not an automatic, an excuse. There are things that we can do and help them to access care, things that we can do at school, making sure they get their medications, or, their, um, or we're making referrals for them to make sure that they're getting the appropriate treatment so that they can be at school. So most kids with health issues do not miss uh, a significant amount of school related to the health issue. Um, and I talked about undiagnosed problems. And so those are, when you're having any health issues or you're suspecting that, that's when you wanna pull in your school nurse or refer them to the school nurse. And so that means your credentialed school nurse not an LVN or a health aide. They don't have the assessment skills or the expertise to really look at it from that broader perspective. And so we wanna have um, a referral to your school nurse to really talk about what's going on and trying to find out, talking with the parent, talking with the student, finding out what the issues are, what care has or has not been received yet, and how can we connect them and support them more to be at school. Um, or, and maybe even doing some education with the parents, because lots of times, Parents don't realize, no, I don't have to keep my child home every day or for this or for that health issue, that we can be at school or it's not severe enough that they should be missing school. So when we're looking at students with chronic health issues, we want to look at it, one, based on their specific needs on a case-by-case -case basis, how much time would we expect a student to be missing school. Um, again, it might, some of it might be related to their diagnosis. Um, some of it might be related to the severity of the issue. And so again, we want to look at it, um, investigate more these red flags. So access to health care. Um, if you have students that have an issue with access to health care, that they're not, um, don't have insurance, or, or for whatever reason they can't get insurance, we can look at what are some other uh, resources that are available, some free clinics or uh, various resources for kids. So one of one person who can assist with this is our health outreach program coordinator. That's Barbara Wilson at LACO. And she does a lot, um, her primary work is looking in assisting families to enrolling for healthcare services. And she can help with either herself doing some kind of outreach at your school site or within your district, or even linking them with uh, certified enrollment um, 
staff that can go ahead and assist the family in finding out what they might be eligible for or to qualify. Um, access to health care also includes a referral from the school nurse. So sometimes the school nurse can work with them if they do have insurance route, if they don't have insurance, to kind of know what clinics are available in the community, what might be a most appropriate referral, you know, to a primary care provider or even sometimes to a specialist uh, to help get them um, the care that they need. And the last, um, families or staff, anybody can call 211. How many of you are available or are knowledgeable about 211? I've heard of it. So 211 is a access point for resources of, of a number of different things, housing, food, uh, healthcare, all kinds of different um, pieces of resources that are available in LA County. Most counties have that, so if you were in another county, they could access 211 for the county resources there. But LA County has a number of things, and you can go online, there are apps, there, you can even call and talk to a live person to get to the resources that you need. So again, there's lots of ways we want to help a family access health care for their student to make sure that they're being treated appropriately and can be at school. When we talk about health problems, uh, the four main ones that we usually think about with chronic health issues are asthma, diabetes, seizures, and food allergies, or food allergies that are severe enough that it can cause anaphylaxis. So I'm going to kind of focus on asthma. Um, but before I get there, I want to talk about chronic illness verification form. How many of you use that, that type of form? That is something that's on um, the CDE website. And it has, um, it's kind of looking at taking a, a proactive view and asking if we know of a student that has a chronic health issue. And it's a, a, a form that the parent would sign and submit to their physician. And it's asking the physician to give us, okay, based on what's the student's diagnosis, based on this health issue, on average, what could we expect um, their attendance to be? About how many times a year would you expect an episode or an incident to occur related to this health condition? And if, when it happens, about how many days might we expect a student to be out relate, in related to this health issue? And then that's brought back to the, fan, to the school. And then the school can use that to say, okay, this is kind of a guideline of what we might think. So for example, the student with asthma, um, oftentimes the physician will say, well, you know, it's about maybe three to four bouts of asthma that's severe enough that might keep them at home. And when they're kept at home, it might be maybe three days at most that this might keep them at home related because their asthma is out of control. And so, so that would kind of give us, you know, anywhere from nine to 12 days that we could expect something related to their asthma. Um, but again, it's just a guideline. But what that helps us do is that, so then when parents are giving us a, a, uh, an, uh, uh, an excuse, a written note for asthma, then we can say, yeah, this kind of falls in line. You know, it's three days. But if we're seeing asthma every Monday, asthma every Friday, that doesn't kind of fit in with the pattern of what we're really thinking. Uh, what kind of symptoms a student might have, and then, then we know that the parent can be writing a note, and yeah, this is legitimate. And so it's just another parameter to, ha doesn't excuse everything, but it's another parameter to give us some guidance on what we might expect related to this particular student. Okay, so in general, as I said, I picked asthma as one that I'm gonna focus on, because it's the number one reason that parents give, the number one health reason for missing school. About uh, 7.1 million children have asthma, and we can, which translates into about one out of 10 children, um, and it's the leading cause of missed school days. On average, anywhere from a minimum of 6.5, but we have some students that miss even more. And so, but what I want you to walk away with is asthma is not an automatic excuse that, oh, well, everything, their 30-some absences are all related to asthma. It may, but that's where we, we can step in, or as your school nurse can step in, to help them figure out what's going on and how can we reduce that absentee rate. Um, because I'm, sometimes the physician might not, might not even be aware that they've been missing school for that much. And so maybe it's a change in medications or looking at something different. 
So just some general guidelines for when a student should be coming to school with their asthma. Um, stuffy nose or not wheezing or anything. Or maybe some mild wheezing they have when they get up in the morning, but once they take their inhaler or their medication, then that wheezing goes away. They're able to do their activities of daily living. They can get up, they can get dressed, they can eat breakfast. They can move around within the house, take care of their needs without being out of breath. <coughs> and there's no extra effort that's causing them to breathe heavily or more rapidly or anything, okay? So those are, as long as your child's able to do that, they're fine to come to school. But if we see signs of an infection, a fever, or the wheezing continues even after they've taken their medication, uh, then we do want to, um, or they're getting tired easily, they're getting out of breath. Just going to the bathroom, getting dressed, makes the student out of breath. Um, their breathing is labored, irregular, or rapid. So, those are reasons that we can say, yes, that is important for your child to stay home. Something's going on. You know, maybe they need to take some nebulizer treatments or something more at home, or maybe they even need to go to the doctor. But this is a student who should not be coming to school. So um, some interventions for what can the school be looking at is, you know, do we have their medication here at school? Do we have an inhaler for them? So medications, not that you have to be up to date on medications for asthma, but for medications, there's long-term medications, long-acting. Those are the ones that they have to take every day to keep them, their, um, to keep them from getting into asthmatic episodes, or the inhalers, or and the inhalers, which are taken whenever you're having an asthma attack or you're having any wheezing or, or breathing problems. And so that's a kind of a quick relief, so we wanna know are they taking controller medications or are they just taking a quick relief? And the rule of thumb that nurses know is that if you have to use your inhaler more than twice a day, twice a week, that you're using it too much and you need to be on some long-term medication. So your school nurse can explore that, can talk with them, figure out what's their medication regimen, do they even have one, uh, what are they using at school, or maybe they're not using something at school and are they on long-term medication so that we can figure out a more um, appropriate plan of care that we can give feedback to the physician. Sometimes school nurses might do asthma education with the student in general, how to manage their asthma, even doing uh, education with parents, making sure the parents understand um, the medications, the plan, what triggers them, and so again, and that the expectation is they certainly can be at school, they can participate in PE, they can do, the expectation is they're under control and can do all the things that other students can do as well. So school nurse might uh, communicate with the healthcare provider, again, to give them feedback on how much school, or even writing a letter, how much school they're missing, um, what's happening, how often they're using their inhaler at school. Sometimes it might even be an issue of indoor air quality at the school site. So like in the classroom, is there are the filters in the air conditioning being changed appropriately? Is there mold in the classroom? Because that can trigger some allergies and um, asthma episodes as well. When we talk about acute illness, we're talking about is student have a cold, they have the flu, or when should they be staying home? And general kinds of things. If the student can do their general routine in the morning without being fatigued or overly tired, uh, without coughing in up a storm or anything like that, then they can be at school. But when they have a fever, have more symptoms of illness, then they should be staying home. And so, um, in particular, what we always want to, what I love to hear, as much as I love that children want to be at school, and that's important, but we also don't want you taking Tylenol in the morning to bring down your fever, and then when you're at school, you have the fever, or you have the fever develops about midday, so, if you need Tylenol to take away your fever or to feel well enough to come to school, then maybe you need to stay home. So this is my plug for when you do need to stay home. Um, so again, um, sometimes just realizing that, particularly with the flu strain that we had this year, you know, people may have been sick for a week, sometimes even a couple of weeks. And so that is, we have to look at the reasons why they're sick and your school nurse could have determined, was this 10 day illness an appropriate time to stay home or not? 
Okay, so um, as far as when you're making um, your verification of illness, if the parent writes a note or whatever, what is your district policy? When is a doctor's note required? So sometimes I've seen some policies that say, well, after a three-day absence, then they have to have a doctor's note, or after a five-day absence, they have to have a doctor's note. That's gonna be up to your district. But realize, again, as I said, there are some um, illnesses, like the flu, that it may not require them to go to the doctor, but it may require them to stay home more than three to five days. So you don't necessarily want to put an extra burden, well, no, we have to have a doctor's note because it was more than three days. Um, believe me, if their kids be, can be at school, they're gonna want them to be at school and not home all day <laughs> for several days sick. Um, doctor's appointments. Um, remember that with doctor's appointments, we try and remind parents to make your doctor's appointments before school or after school, if most possible, but sometimes with some of the clinics, um, it is difficult. They give you when the appointment is available. Or if they need an immunization, they'll say you come to this time, you come and you wait, and, and they give out slips, and once they've hit all their maximum doses that they give that day, then they say, well, come back tomorrow. So now they're meeting the second day. So again, just try and investigate a little bit more is what are the issues, you know, as a private, person with great health insurance, I can say, well, no, I can't come at this time, or I need to bring my child at this time or that time. But sometimes families don't always have that option, depending on where they're going or getting their care, and sometimes they have to take the appointment that's available and that's given to them. So just being aware and sensitive to that. Any questions about doctor's notes or anything? Okay. For communicable diseases, um, the exclusion dates are going to vary depending on what the illness is and whether they're receiving care for it or antibiotics or, or not. So it's gonna vary on the, what the actual disease is, the symptoms, the severity of, the, of it, if they're able to take medication for it or not, such as antibiotics, and if the health department is involved on it. So for example, whooping cough. How many of your kids have had whooping cough? We know that it kinda, the, the um, the effect of the vaccines starts to wear off just before around middle school. So we do have lots of outbreaks of kids in like sixth grade. Seventh grade, they're supposed to get a, a booster, but uh, fifth, sixth grade that we may have kids or even high school students that are getting a uh, whoopee cough. And so that requirement says if they start antibiotics, they have to be out for five days while they're on antibiotics before they can come back to school. Or if they choose not to use antibiotics, then it's 21 days. So again, that's gonna vary based on that, but usually if it's whooping cough or some of the, the speci specific uh, communicable diseases, public health department is going to get involved, and so they're gonna be telling us how long the student has to stay out, okay? Um, flu, while the student is in having the aches and pains and fever, they're gonna need to stay out of school essentially until the fever is, is gone. They're no longer having a fever and not having to use Tylenol or, or a, a medication to reduce the fever. For other illnesses such as like strep throat or um, scarlet fever, things like that, they have to have antibiotics beyond that for at least 24 hours and they have to feel well enough in order to, to come back to school. So if they've been on it for 24 hours, and they feel okay to get up and move around and everything else, or not itchy or whatever, then they can come back to school at that point. So you can see, depending on what the diagnosis is, it's going to vary um, based on how long they have to be out or not. But when you have a reportable communicable disease to the public health department and your school nurse to, will know what's reportable or not, um, then the health department directs how long they must stay out of school. And usually the health department or the doctor will, actually the health department will let us know when the student is clear to return to school. So sometimes there might be a case where the doctor says, oh, they're fine to go back to school this day. And public health is saying, no, you need to wait a few more days. So public health department will trump what the doctor says. Also, we might have instances with communicable diseases if there's a, any, uh, sometimes it's just one case in a school or sometimes depending on what the, like with measles, that would be just one case. Um, 
with whooping cough, it might be two or three cases, or maybe just one case, that any students who are not immunized, for whatever reason, um, that they may have to stay out of school for the full 21 days of the incubation period. So again, that's directed by public health. And if a student has, even if they are immunized and the student has a chronic illness that may make them immunocompromised for some way, they are at risk of developing um, diseases after exposure. So sometimes, so basically the public health department will contact the school or the school will contact the public health department if they have a reportable diagnosis or suspect a diagnosis of that and then the public health department will do kind of an investigation to figure out what's going on, who's at risk, who needs to be excluded, and for how long. Okay, here's my, my soapbox on lice. How many of you have a no lice policy for your school district? Okay, how many of you have a no knit policy? How many of you don't know the difference? <laughs> or don't know? Okay, so a no lice policy means that, see those little critters up there? Those are lice in various stages. So if you have lice, then you can't be at school. The nits, the nits are actually the little eggs, the little white eggs that you see on the hair, and that's a no knit policy. So majority of districts used to have, so everyone's gonna start scratching their head, now, right? <laughs> So the majority of districts used to have a no knit policy. If we see any eggs, you can't be at school. The parent has to remove all of them. And then about, probably about 20 years ago, the research was not supporting a no knit policy. And probably about 10 years ago, or maybe a little more, the California Department of Public Health put out guidelines for schools that said, no, it's a no lice policy is the best practice, not a no knit policy. The American Academy of Pediatrics also puts out a, a report every five years that says what the latest is regarding lice. And so what, what they're saying now is that, okay, if it's ideally the practice should be that if a student has lice or is identified as having lice, and someone sees nits or they see something at school, that based on research, majority of kids do not contract lice from school, they contract it from other family, neighbors, friends, sports teams, whatever else. That it's typically not communicable, no. They typically don't get it at school, they get it from outside of school. So, anyway, so by the time that somebody sees nits or sees lice, that they've probably had it for several weeks already. So by the time you, s you notice it or that you see it, everyone's been exposed for over a month already. So what should happen is that the student is then referred to the health office, somebody checks, and what they're looking for is live lice. Do they actually see some little critters, okay? If it's just the nits, no big deal. In fact, most of the nits that you see are just empty shells. They have to be like this close to the scalp in order to have a viable, to be a viable egg. Once they're past this much, it's just a shell. So for lots of kids, they're being excluded for the, having a shell in their hair, not because they actually have a lice or a louse. So they're checked if they have live lice, then they're sent home at the end of the school day. Because having them there a few more hours, they've been at school already for weeks, that a few more hours is not gonna make a difference, so they should not. Now this just wigs everybody out. Everybody's like, oh, we're gonna have rapid lice. You know what, we don't. On the flip side, if it's just nits, let the parent know, we didn't see any live lice, but you know, you might wanna follow up with your own child. So the recommendation is that then the child goes home at the end of the day, and then they are, parent shampoos their hair that night with the pedicula side, something they can buy at the drugstore. And then they come back to school the next day, they're rechecked, are there any live lice? No live lice, they go back to school. They go back to class. So that is the expected, or not the, well, that is the expected course for any student who says that they, or anybody who says they have lice. Do we check the whole classroom? No. We might check siblings or somebody who's your best friend or do you share any hats or combs with or anything, 
we might, sh you know, as a courtesy, we can check those students, but we normally don't have to go in, or it's not recommended that we go in and check the entire classroom. So it's very different from 15, 20 years ago. And so, do we have to send out a parent notification? It varies. Typically, no. That's generally the recommendation that you know to, don't need to do that. But you might want to if you have a few cases in a classroom and um, you know your own community. Sometimes if you send out a letter, it causes hysteria. Mm -hmm. And you know it's not worth it. Or you may have a community where everybody will know that so-and-so has been sent home and all the parents talk and then you'll be in trouble because why didn't the school send a notice? So again, based on what your community, how it works, you may or may not, or your health office may or may not send a note. But one of the last American Academy of Pediatrics articles that I read, they said it could be, parent could claim a denial of FAPE by excluding them because they have NITS and not lice. So just about, I haven't heard of any, anyone claiming that or filing a complaint, but it could be. So, any questions about lice? Big bids. Super lice. Super lice. <laughs> you hear that every fall in the news about the super lice. Um, that they're, um, they don't, or the shampoos aren't working or anything like that. You know what, and that how it's going across the states. It's been in California for 20 years already. So there are some that are more effective than not. And there's a brochure from the California Department of Public Health that we can share with families that says you know, which ones are better or which ones tend to work better. Um, but yes, so lice should not be a big deal. Doesn't cause harm. It just makes everybody like, oh my goodness, you know. So um, that shouldn't be a reason that we're excluding. So we don't want to see kids going home because of NITS, only kids going home because of lice, preferably at the end of the school day. They shampoo, so maybe an excused absence might be a couple of days. If they couldn't shampoo that night, they shampoo the next day um, and get that taken care of. And then they come back to school and if they're fine, they're fine. If not, they go home that day. And we might have some different strategies for parents to use. But um, they, we should not be seeing a student out for weeks or a month because of lice. That is unexcused. So here's the document, the latest document from 2015 from California Department of Public Health. That's the, you can Google, or you can just Google the title and I'll get you to that as well. Okay, immunizations, just briefly. Um, students that are unimmunized from school, they are um, excluded from school. And if there's an exposure to diseases, that's again, according to public health how long they have to be excused from. So students, so if we have a student, we find that they're not up to date or they're not getting their next dose when it was due, they have 10 days to comply. We give them a note, it's good for two, 10 school days. At the end of that, they must be excluded, okay? Um, or, particularly with the seventh graders, oh well, we'll let them in even though they're missing their Tdap immunization. So if we let them in, it was in the, in the financial audit for schools last year where for every day you allowed this child to attend school that wasn't up to date, you could be disallowed the ADA for every single child for every single day that that occurred with them. They took it out of the audit this year, but they left a place for it in case they want to bring it back. So, Anyways, uh, special education students are also students who, because of the law, there's a loophole that allows students with an IEP to attend school without having their immunizations. So again, but again, if it comes back to um, an exposure to a disease, they may be excluded for several days. Okay, um, here's one. Your son's poor grades are caused by a condition known as attendance deficit disorder. <laughs> but I think with this brochure it might help. Anyways, so uh, the other thing sometimes we also have to look at, is this a health issue related? excuse of why they're out, or is it a, an excuse? And unfortunately, you know, I always want to think the best and we want to work with parents to help get their children into school and meet their needs at school, but sometimes just be aware that the asthma is used as an excuse and not really related to their asthma. And when that happens, 
I, you know, the school nurse will call the doctor's office just to verify all their absence. They're not asking for information. They're just saying, I just want to verify these notes that I have from the doctor's office related that the student was in for asthma. And sometimes what happens is, no, they haven't been here all these days. Or no, they haven't had any problems this year at all related to their asthma as far as I'm aware. So again, wanting to know what's actually going on. And sometimes when I've asked for a release of information, the parent says, oh, well, we're changing to another doctor. We have a new doctor. And they're constantly changing or sh doctor shopping uh, for someone who will support their absences. I've even had it, un unfortunately, where a family member worked in a doctor's office and they would just stamp and write the notes. So again, I don't always want to be suspicious, but just be aware that, that that can happen as well because we want to do what we can to help support them at school, but we also need to be able to work with the parent as well. So your school nurse is the person with the expertise to evaluate the presence or absence of medical conditions that affect a student's attendance. So again, I can't say enough, get your school nurse involved particularly frequent absences um, that are excused, you know, getting attendance data to them, or they can also look at what does their own health office data mean? What is that showing or trends of when the student's going home? So identify students with needs. The school nurse can communicate with the parents. They can write an individualized health uh, plan, which is their case management for that health issue at school. But you also need to consider, is this a student with a health issue would they qualify or benefit from a Section 504 plan, accommodation plan that helps us to meet their needs at school? Um, you know, just recognizing trends, um, contacting parents, helping them access some of the things that we talked about before. Um, so sometimes students with health issues, whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed, helping them to access care because we might want to look at would they benefit from other things, such as 504, um, home and hospital instruction, is it severe enough that they're meeting, missing enough school, or some kind of um, other alternative. So um, the school nurse can talk about looking at the health concerns, what are the trends in their health office visits, gee, they've never been here for this, or yes, this is a major problem, this is what we're seeing. So I always put in a little plug, so schedule your school nurse to participate at your SARB meeting because they can provide a wealth of insight and information for you. All right, thank you very much. Tim, um, Catlin, I'm gonna invite you up. You can't be a good administrator if you're not a good parent, and he's got a, a child to observe, his own, in a very special event today. But I invited Tim up a little bit out of schedule order because he's gonna share with us a story about a student we could not get to come in. Um, but I w asked him, could you just please tell us about it because it, was, it gave me goosebumps when I heard the story. So here you go. Thank you, Marion. Actually, uh, I, I think if I could take this time, I, I just wanna publicly say thank you for all the support you give us as SARB chairs and the work that we do. So thank you, Marion. And I'm saying that too because I should apologize to her because I noticed on the agenda <laughs> that I'm at the end as part of the question and answer and I'm bailing on her. So your committee keeps getting smaller and smaller. So sorry for that. Um, yes, uh, Susan, anytime you bring up lice, I want to scratch. I, I can't help it. I've, I've been doing this 16 years and uh, as a SARB chair and CWA and um, you know, I have seen a lot of different cases, and so there's also a monotony about doing SARP. So my story is about a particular student who really caught all of our attention, and so here, here's how it went. It was a, a particular day where, I don't know how your SARP meetings go, but it seems like uh, there's, it's the same pattern for each SARP. So if it's the, the parents that come in and say, I didn't know I was supposed to bring my child. It'll be that day. So every SARB in order, and they went to school that one day or whatnot. So this is a particular day where, um, as I marked it, the, the students come in and after they've described it, the presenter has described you know, what has been going on, I mean, all kinds of things, really bold outbursts, behavior issues, and then, of course, chronic truancy and the whole bit. But then they're not 
bold enough during that meeting that when we ask them, you know, what's going on, they're not bold enough to say anything. You know, they're always speaking at this level. Why aren't you going to school? And I can't hear you, you know? And it's like, okay, so the first case comes in, and um, I don't know how it was heard, but we have one SAR panel member who has superhuman hearing, but he was just angry and withdrawn, and dad um, needed translation, so you know he's getting everything secondhand. And in the middle of one of his comments, he told the person who asked him a very kind, gentle question to shut the F up. We didn't all hear it, but she did. And, and she went, what did you say? And he repeated it. So then we all could hear it. So that was the, where we were at, okay? This is how this thing was going. So then the second case comes in. Another student, withdrawn, can't speak up. Third case withdrawn, won't speak up, and so, you know, you've sat on these SARMs, most of the time your panel is just waiting for the information to come out, and they're writing things until they're ready to give their speech, and motivational, whatever. So, our last student comes in, withdrawn, looked like he wasn't gonna speak. The parents said nothing, and so the presenter went through the whole litany, and we're talking just about, he's in 10th grade, it was just before middle school this all started happening. So I mean, terrible attendance. Just not showing up to school. Everybody has tried everything. The only thing that was noticed as we're looking at this is you know, you're preparing to ask questions after the presenter is done, um, is that it looked like his attendance had improved like 100% within the last month. I mean, you, you could go back and you could tell, you know, three, four days in a row, every week, for the last four, almost five years. And so, when it came time to ask questions, everybody there, I think, had the same question. I don't remember who asked it. Um, said, why the change in attendance? We know you're here, because of course he d done enough from the beginning of the year to get to this point. And, um, the thing that shocked me immediately was he took a breath, which meant he's actually gonna, he's gonna speak, and I might be able to hear him. I mean, most, you know, most is just, I don't know why they're just trying to, you know, like, but he went, <gasps> you know, like this, and so I, I looked up and he said, I, over the holidays, was at a family gathering, and I mean, he was speaking like this, super articulate, and my aunt, was in the room, we were all eating, everyone was having a good time, she pulled me out. And we went to a place where I can't tell you. And when I was done with my aunt, <laughs> I decided I am going to go to school every single day. And I, I gotta tell you, um, I wanted him here to tell you it. Because when you heard it, I mean, it was like one of those moments where, oh my gosh, you know, we were all shocked. We didn't know what to do. People wanted to say, well, you, well, Oh, okay, good. You're, you're going to go to school. So what, what was the change? Well, it was my aunt. She, and she went down this whole list. And for some reason, that was the spark. That lady, who he hadn't seen in a while either, it said to him some things, which he really didn't disclose, but it's made a difference because the attendance started before the holidays. We're count, we counted it the other day because we've been gently trying to get him to come here. I, I wanted you to hear from him. Coolest kid ever. I mean, really a cool kid. But he has been there four months, solid, not missed a day. And I mean, I'm telling you bad attendance prior to that. So that's, that's the story. It would have been great if you could have heard it from him because you, you would have seen that spark and how it worked. But SARB does make a difference. And you know, if I can tell you anything, um, just keep doing what you're doing because every once in a while, that happens and it's worth it. So. It's totally Thank you, Mary. It. Thank you, Tim. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from that perspective. It only takes one adult to make a huge difference in the kids' lives. And even if Tim couldn't bring him in, we'll get him into the studio. Maybe he'll think that's pretty darn cool. And then we'll hear his story from his own mouth. But the fact that he was able to articulate that at the meeting 
And he was that lovely surprise, like the frosting at the end of the cake. You know, and you, some of you pick it off. I eat it first. But it, it's what you have that this says, wow, you can make a huge difference. Um, Cindy Chafee, would you please come on up with Sammy? And I'm going to ask you to make an introduction. And this next presentation is about being those adults in the lives because it's about changing the adults, not the kids necessarily. <coughs> Thanks, Marian. That's okay. I have a good uh, playground voice. Hello. Hi. I'm the PBIS queen. That's what they call me here at LACO. Um, positive behavior interventions and supports. And you might think, well, what on earth does that have to do with attendance? Well, in one of the most recent longitudinal studies that was done across 37 states for 10 years on schools implementing PBIS at high school with fidelity, they found it does, in fact, increase attendance, decrease dropout rates, and increase graduation. So um, 10 years of studying high schools in 37 states. That study was just published. So if we're, we're here to look at the idea of attendance, how to keep kids in school, uh, what you heard Laurel speak about, Dr. Baer, has much to do with some of the very same things that we do. And uh, if you want to know more about what we do, ask John, because uh, Torrance Unified is working with us in PBIS. Now, um, right now, we're actually training over 355 school teams across Los Angeles County in 48 districts and charters. And some of those schools are right here in our own LA County Office of Education district. And those are our schools that are known as our juvenile detention facilities. Now, believe it or not, PBIS is especially implemented in juvenile detention facilities and has some of the very same impact. I know that might sound funny. So like, how can attendance be an issue in a juvenile detention facility? Like, don't they have to go to school? Well, interestingly, no. Remember, they may live there, but getting them to class is an issue. Because we need them to want to go to class. We need them to want to get out of the dorm and go to class and not be sick. And you might think, really, why can there be attendance issues? I, I thought that at first. Really? OK, they're like in like student jail, right? So why would they not go to school? That's why. Because they still have a voice, and they still have to have interest. And so the huge impact we're seeing across the country in juvenile detention facilities implementing PBIS is astronomical. So last fall, at the state PBIS conference in Sacramento, Sammy was one of the featured speakers who spoke about how we're implementing PBIS here in Los Angeles County. There were two other presentations made about other juvenile detention facilities implementing in other places in the state of California. So we asked, Amy, uh, we asked Sammy, would she come back and do a repeat performance for you of her presentation that she gave to everyone in the state of California. Sammy is what we call the district coach for PBIS in all of our LACO schools. Now that's not just our juvenile detention facilities. We have schools also like LOXA and IPOLY. And so she's the district coach, meaning she's the one I work with, that coordinates PBIS training and implementation in all of the schools that she's responsible for. So trust me when I tell you that she's one of the hardest working people I know, and she does a super, super job. Sammy, they're all yours. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sammy. I'm the, actually the coordinator of uh, Divisional People Services from uh, from app programs. So most of you like are really like more familiar with the big Lego, which is the team here, like to support all 80 school districts. But for our app programs, actually we are serving, um, just like what Cindy said, like we're serving some spatial population. <laughs> so we have three junior hall schools and also like a 10, 10 camp schools plus one uh, school with um, residential facility center. And then um, also including like a, um, 13 county community schools. And that is including like our independent study programs and plus two specialized high school, which is uh, Laksa and Ipoli. So uh, for our schools, you know, of course, like uh, just what like Cindy said, you know, really like we're gonna implement PBIS in school, in um, this uh, juvenile detention schools. Yes, because our goal is try to really make a safe environment and make them comfortable to come to school. Because most of our students, they don't have 
you know, very good experience with the school. So they might, you know, they, there's some reason they end up with this. So most of them probably drop out or they might not even go to school. So like um, this is um, actually the good um, opportunities. We can really like encourage them to come to school. That's why we decide we need to implement PBIS in these uh, schools. So uh, today we want to share with you um, for our, um, the PBIS implementation experience um, at Camp Scott. So Camp Scott, is the only probation facility serving girls. So um, they actually is in like Santa Clarita, California. I'm not sure, like uh, probably most of you are not aware where they are because if you, uh, you know, like hiking, you go like a uh, Laverne or go to Malibu, you will find somewhere there's a sign say, hey, camp, camp, um, like Camp Affable or like a campus Kilpatrick. That's our school. They are hiding in the mountains. So yeah, and then that's, <laughs> Definitely our school. So, um, so this in this facility, like uh, it, it can house up to 110 students. But um, you know, recently because uh, we have uh, really like changes in the justice system, they try to push the student with minor violations back to the community with support, and only keep um, the students with really severe violation in the um, probation de uh, detention um, facility. So that's why our population shrink a lot. So in last school year, um, camps got scattered. Okay, here we say camps got scattered because of the shrinking. So like uh, the probation actually consolidates the sites. So now we only have camps got. So they put all girls in one camp now. And uh, so last year, we still have both. And then they are serving 232 different girls in one year. And then, but uh, on average, like uh, the daily population is only 30 to 35. But down to, uh, to, this, um, to this school year, actually the population is down to 25. So I just want to tell you the trend of um, on our population. Okay, so, um, so this is actually our team in, um, for Camp Scott. So definitely we have a coach, and Coach Shante, um, she, uh, unfortunately she cannot make it because she has some <coughs> uh, health issues, so she's not able to be here um, to share the experience with you. But like um, Shantae used to work uh, in our one, one of our other sites, which is our first site doing PBIS, which uh, is um, McAuliffe. And then she bring in the experience and to guide this uh, Scott team to re implement PBIS here. So we also have our counselor, counselors on board and then also have our other staff, like a paraeducators, to be in charge on um, different roles, like uh, for example, the data entry or like uh, the communication. But from this list, you can see like uh, some spatial team members, which is our probation officers, and also the staff from the Department of Mental Health. Because our students stay with us 24 hours seven, so we are not only implement PBIS in the school ground, so we actually push it to the uh, facility-wide. So we are not call ourselves as uh, school-wide PBIS, we, we actually say facility-wide PBIS. Um, so this is actually our trainings, and we do our trainings and our coaching with the uh, PBIS team here. Um, Cindy is uh, leading a good team, like uh, help, help and support us. In the past, like um, because McAuliffe and Scott, they implement PBIS earlier, so they are trained. Uh, they are trained with outside school districts. So you might find like uh, you know like in Lancaster or uh, Saugus, you might some like uh, see a small team sitting in the corner, and that actually is our school team. But um, you know there's pros and cons on to be trained with outside school districts. Of course, we are learning the experience from outside school districts, but at the same time, we are our concerns or some needs are not able to be addressed in the training because our setting and our spatial population. So at the end of um, last year, when all of the rest of uh, our sites on board, and we decide to bring everyone um, into one cohort. So now all of us are in one cohort. And then we also uh, be able to utilize the experience from McCollum and Scott to guide our uh, other sites to implement PBIS. And um, let's take a look on the practice uh, in this uh, specific site. So this is, uh, most of you, if you are implement PBIS, you are probably very familiar, uh, you, you are supposed to have a school-wide uh, metrics. So for us, we call it a facility-wide PBIS metrics. So as you can see here, the difference is like uh, we cover all the areas in the facility. 
So like uh, for example, like a movement. Movement is not only saying like uh, from classroom to classroom, we also saying like, uh, you know, for example, for, from the living unit to classroom or from living unit to other location. And then we also include like a shower or dormitory like um, you are not gonna see at your metrics. <coughs> and then also I'll uh, have the medical counseling. This is actually the health services and the mental health demand. And um, that is, um, oh, I'm sorry, back here quickly. So how we create this, this is not created by only school staff. Again, this is actually uh, created by the whole, all, the whole team, like um, uh, including um, probation and DMH. And um, we also have uh, metrics for specific area. So for example, this is our um, classroom metrics. So our classroom metrics, Shantae actually meeting with um, the each uh, teachers and then guide them through like a how to make their classroom metrics. So they are gonna go by the uh, expectation and then go by the routines. And I also wanna mention something very special like uh, in our system because it calls like a BMP point system. BMP point system is uh, behavior, <laughs> behavior management program point system. This is created by probation. So uh, probation, they um, divided one day into several uh, time periods. So each time period, uh, the student can earn zero to two points. And when you hear this, like uh, some people who are implement PBSO to tier two might be very familiar because this is like very similar to check-in, check-out system. And then actually, we, our probation have it already. So we definitely adopt this system um, to our PBIS. So um, for every area, like uh, we are gonna using like uh, the points and each points we set up their rubric and also like uh, the list all the expected behavior. So the students are very clear what type of a behavior they are doing and then they can earn their points. And I wanna um, say that, uh, this, this is um, actually is really um, be more like a, like a consequences um, for our students. Cause like, uh, you know, like um, for the points, when they accumulate a certain points, like for example, like each student, if they get more than 20 points a day, then they, they can make their day. When we say make days, like on May Day means like actually they, could, they can lead to their early release. So for example, like uh, you know, the student uh, uh, probation actually have their own formula. So um, when the student like earns certain amount of May Days, then uh, they, they will take that into consideration for their early release. And then also how many days they earn is gonna uh, determine how early they can be released. So that's why like uh, the student understand this definitely is their consequences for their behavior with us. Um, so um, after we talk about like a matrix and the next step is how we're gonna teach them about the behavior. Because again, like a lot of students not like our, you know, our own kids, like for example, I have two kids, like three and five, they're messing around all day long. And then like two days ago, my son tried to be a Superman, so he jumped like a, from a chair to a, a table and then actually hurt his own leg. And then, um, you know, of course, he cried and then kind of uh, make a big deal of it. So we try to teach him, okay, sorry, like, you know, you see, like this is not appropriate behavior you're supposed to do in, in the living room and that's why you hurt yourself. We teach them the consequences and then also guide them like, okay, this is not expected behavior. So, okay, this happened to our kids every day. So we give them the consequences. We kind of teach them what they need to do. And, but unfortunately, this is not happening to our, our, kid, our students. Because a lot of our students are from a uh, dysfunction family. So they might not have uh, caring adults like around them and then show them this every day. And then so, and sometimes they drop off from school. So even like, I will even have a bad experience in school. So they don't even like hear anything about this in the past of their life. So while they're with us, we try to teach them about their expected uh, behavior. So we are trying to uh, use uh, our metrics doing the weekly lesson and activities. So uh, when they are doing, uh, we kind of pull out one area uh, from, the, from the metrics and then focusing on that um, area to go over the behavior expectation with them. So every day, like uh, we have a, pe a period of time called opening circle. So students uh, can actually sit down and discuss about something they, they would like to discuss. We utilize that time like uh, every Monday. So the class, either like the teacher or the student, they would lead the discussion. And uh, they are using like a ESO paper or like a, sometimes a whiteboard, or um, we give them also on the paper, like on uh, this grid to list their appropriate or inappropriate behavior. So like our students, you know, like uh, we, we, the students actually are kind of like, they kind of just 
put it down, and then at, after they complete it, we ask them to post it in the, in the classroom. So every day, like us teachers will spend a few minutes, kind of review it, and then if the students, um, they have something they want to edit on, then definitely they are welcome to edit on. And then at the end of the, at the, end of, uh, the week, the Friday, during the opening circle time, then we also um, kind of get together and then have the students share out their experience with uh, associate to these areas and the expectation. So sometimes like, uh, you know, the student can share their appropriate behavior they, they demonstrate in this week, and sometimes they can also share the inappropriate one. Because uh, we, without judgment, because we want them to feel safe to really discuss and then review their behavior throughout the week. And uh, um, also other than the point system, we also have some acknowledgement and rewards for them. So like um, we create something called good job tickets, which is just very simple, like uh, you can get it in any sort, like, uh, you know, like uh, the raffle tickets. So anytime they do something good, they, do some, they say something appropriately, then we would provide them a ticket, say, thank you for doing that, good job. So that's our good job tickets. And every seven tickets, they can exchange to a good girl gram. And good girl gram, they can redeem one item from probation, uh, probation stores. They can including like a hygiene kit, or like a, sometimes a snack, or sometimes even some stationery. You know, you know, sometimes a little thing you make them joyful because you know they are actually loved down there. So, um, so at the end of the week, we also do the raffle. Like uh, we kind of draw ten tickets and then provide them rewards. And then uh, other than that, we also have the free, free Friday tickets. Give them thirty minutes uh, per per month, and then they can do the entertainment they prefer to. For example, play cards or or like play board game. Sometimes they even just want to spend 30 minutes to make some cards for to their uh, significant others. Because we do have boys, like a farmer caliph, they really like, um, you know, we give them all t uh, different choices for them, but like uh, they really choose to sit down and then write a card to their mom or someone they, they feel important to them. Yeah, and then uh, also like uh, we have movie day, like um, using like uh, one block per month and then they can watch movie. And at the end of the month, we also have a ceremony really um, to um, acknowledge the students who get the most tickets of the month and then provide them a PBIS certificate. You know, sometimes you think like a, a piece of paper, a certificate, it means nothing, but actually it means a lot to them because in their life, they probably never receive any certificate, you know, to celebrate their success. Uh, so, um, so after we review all the positive behaviors, then we also want to, of course, we're going to talk about the problem behavior because they are not, you know, perfect, like I only have a po um, positive behavior. So like uh, for, this is actually our procedure to respond to those like a problem behavior. So daily practice is like a, the way we actually teaching them, reminding them about their effective behavior. And um, um, e unfortunately, if the student really doing something inappropriate, for example, cursing, because people, of course, we know we are not supposed to say F words, but in their life, probably they feel like this is part of their life, part of their daily conversation. They didn't feel, feel a big deal of that. So like uh, they are, might say something without thinking, and then sometimes our teacher just need to you know, give them a quick reminder, since we are teaching them already, and say, hey, don't forget we talked about this this morning, and then just a quick reminder, uh, most of the students can really adjust and say, oh, sorry, I forgot, and then they will correct their uh, you know, proper <coughs> behavior, but if, the some behaviors is uh, uh, misbehavior is continue, continuous, and then we are going to the next step, which we call restructure. Restructure process is like a, we have our probation officers on the side, and then also we have a school admin um, there to sup support teachers. So if because sometimes teachers cannot really stop their instruction, so they might ask the students, uh, "Hey, um, would you mind like uh, you step out for five minutes?" So have a probation officers or our admins really talk to the students regarding this behavior issues. And then, you know, sometimes our students just need, you know, five minutes to cool down. So they step out and then, you know, talk to them privately. And then the admin or even the uh, probation officer evaluate, feel like they are okay, then they will send them back to the classroom. And then they can continue staying in the classroom. So, so Sammy, is a restructure sort of like a discipline referral to the office? In um, yes, but like uh, as God, like uh, we try to give them like um, 
we don't we try not to make it um, the referral because referral to them is a big deal because uh, remember earlier I mentioned about point system so they earn 20 points they can make their day but one referral can really like uh, take it away so that's why we try not to do it we give them one more like a you know chance like a, to correct their behavior so for the first time we don't really you know make a referral Make call, we, call, we didn't call it referral. We kind of call it like a just restructure. So the next step is the referral. Okay, if they continue uh, doing the same uh, misbehavior, then we will trigger this uh, referral. It means like um, at this point, probably like uh, the student need more other support. So we might have our counselors or have our school psychologists really talk to the students or sometimes because we also have DMH on board. So like um, DMH staff can also come in and talk to them. So this will trigger the, the referral process. And if, you know, unfortunately, if this is like a continue and then, then it really like we want to consider the suspension, then uh, our teachers need to contact the admin to really discuss about if this is uh, necessary to suspend the students. If we end up like uh, we want to suspend the students, then teachers will provide the classwork, and then also at the same time we will need to want to contact the the, uh, co the reentry conference with the students to to go over the the incidents, and then also like uh, the consequences of the incidents, and also inform the the parents and the probation officers. So um, so this is basically like uh, our our. Um, the process of uh, doing the uh, discipline. So um, after doing all this, def definitely the next step is we need to document everything. So we have our uh, ODR, uh, which is like uh, the paper uh, referral form, and then also we have uh, the ARIES, which is our uh, student information system that we need to document. Um, so uh, for the referral, we try to make it simple because a lot of time our teachers cannot stop their instruction. So like uh, we, you see like, uh, we, oh, sorry, we kind of try to uh, make it like a check boxes, so like uh, they can do a quick check boxes, like uh, doing probably like spend like uh, 10 minutes, I mean 10 seconds, and then kind of check off, and then uh, they can turn it in to inform the, the office. But after after the class, and then teachers still responsible to enter everything into Aries, and then our admin will go back in and then do the uh, make the decision for the the um, referral. So since we, we talk about the entering the data, so we want to talk, um, going to go over like uh, how we collect the data. So I'm going to give you like um, the histories quickly because last school year, actually because um, McAuliffe and Scott are those uh, two sites we implement PBIS earlier. So we choose those two sites to as the pilot site to use Swiss for data collection. Swiss is actually a database, another database designed uh, by the University of Oregon. So uh, they are, we are using that uh, to collect only behavior data. But um, we, again, because this is another database, so we really need to rely on the clerk to uh, enter the data into Swiss. And it, you know, it caused some problems for us, because uh, to be honest with you, because like uh, you know, for Scott, because Scott is a smaller site, we only have like a 30 to 35 students last year, but um, for McAuliffe, actually, it's five times larger than this site. So, and especially that is a boys' site with a severe violation students. So, like uh, the pile, the you know, we have piles of the referrals every day. So we are not able to catch up, like uh, entering all the data in uh, in another database. So in this school year, we decide we switch it back to Aries to record everything in one database. So in the past, like um, we have three different modules to record like a uh, minor behavior, uh, minor behaviors, and then minor behavior concerns and or the major behavior concerns. But in this school year, in order to put um, pull out the data, so we put everything in one module. That's the way we like uh, we kind of like, uh, adjust to to collect the data. And then teacher again, teachers and admins are. Both of them need to enter the data. So by doing this, we are avoid um, we are able to avoid double entry. And then also, like we are doing a paradigm shift for discipline and data collection, because right now everything is under one module. And then by do, um, doing under one module, so you are able to see the history of the discipline. So like for example, like um, you know, for discipline, we are not supposed to suspend the students for their first offense other than those uh, 4800 A through E. 
but in the past, we are, it's really hard for us to track how to know if they're really the first offense because we are separate like them into different modules. So now, it, because it's under one module, we are able to see the history of the discipline. So we are, it's easier for us to, check on, tra uh, to track that. And then also, like uh, we, uh, in our board policy, we require at least three other means of correction before we suspend the students. So um, from there, we also, um, the, that new module we created, actually we, we, we uh, request the teachers and the admin enter at least three other means of correction you know, what, with the referrals. So we are able to ensure you know, stu we are providing other means of correction and in other intervention to the students before we suspend them. So how we use the data is like, a, you know, for PBI, our PBIS team actually meet with the teacher to review the data regularly. So um, every Monday, hopefully like a Monday, sometimes delayed Tuesday, I send out the weekly data report, I mean discipline data report. So that data report is indicates the students with their uh, suspension number, and then also like uh, the other one is the teachers with, uh, you know, their, with their suspension number, you know, how many suspension the teacher gave out by periods. So we can really see like, a, you know, the trend like, a, what's going on in school with the teacher and with the students. So um, by doing this, like a staff, actually in the past, like a how, you know, we always, like a, in the past, our staff really seen like a discipline as punishment. Because, you know, and then our, our suspension rate is always high. And then, but after we really implement PBIS, because t uh, staff have a, uh, the chance to be trained for like uh, strategies or inter uh, interventions to, do the positive re reinforcement, and then to deal with their, uh, the students' misbehavior. And then also students also have the chance to, to learn how to demonstrate appropriate uh, behavior. So our staff are also able to, be, uh, to react to those uh, behavior appropriately. So this is like a really like a big improve for our, our sites. Yeah, and then, um, so this is actually is our data. So uh, on your left-hand side, this is uh, SAIS, which is uh, the, the survey for the, all the staff in the, in the school. And then on the right-hand side, this is actually the survey just for the team, our PBIS team members. So from SAIS, you might see, you might question, like, how come the number is, you know, up, down, up? You know, because unfortunately, you know, back to my first slides, um, you know, our population shrink. So probation doing a, a lot of uh, con uh, consultation for our sites. So our uh, staff actually moving around. So uh, our staff, that means like our staff are not that stable. So that's why like when we do the survey, you can see the number actually, you know, up, down, up, down, because like um, the changes of the staff. But good thing is our team members, oh, our team members is um, kind of like a remain more stable compared to the whole staff. So you know that's uh, that's a good that's a good sign. So um, for in, um, then the, this slide is talking about the incident data. So last school year, the whole site have two hundred and seventy five incidents. But um, as you can see here, the major major behavior concerns actually is less than twenty, and then most of them actually are back down to like a minor. That means like uh, because for our uh, definition, we set up the major one more uh, for suspensions. So that means like we have less suspensions, but probably like more for referrals, but less suspension. And then um, here the, uh, we have 94% of the students only receive zero to one referrals. And then uh, only 6% of them receive um, two to five. So it's really like, a, you know, our rates down a lot. Okay, when we, when we are doing PBIS, we are not only implement PBIS, because in, at, uh, in our facility, we try to in, um, integrate like all the programs together under this PBIS framework. So we are also doing RTSA, uh, Road to Success Academy. This is actually a model to integrate in instruction and intervention for incarcerated students. So this is most likely is a, a project-based learning uh, program. And then uh, we try to blend the social skills into curriculum. And then we are trying to uh, help them to learn how to make a good decision on their behavior. So and also like uh, on the bottom, you can see like a DBT. This is uh, dialectical behavior therapy. We are doing cross training for all types of the strategies for probation, PMH, and legal staff. So 
everyone will be on board and we are using the same strategies, using the same language when we are working with the students. And of course, we are doing like a NCI training, non-crisis uh, intervention training, and doing trauma-informed care training. All of um, this work actually work together to do the cross-training. Okay, so um, this is actually like uh, the buy-in, because uh, how we get the buy-in from our staff? First of all, we definitely need to provide continuous um, you know, training or support to our staff. So we are using our PD time um, to really help our uh, teachers learn new strategies or interventions. And then also um, for classroom intervention, sometimes like a teachers, they might have some questions in the classroom, but we always have the staff on, um, on board to help them. Like uh, for example, our school psychologist who is our, uh, um, our coach, PBS coach, and then also have counselor at DMH there to support the classroom teachers. And the team members also work individually with the, the uh, staff to guide them through how to do the PBIs in the classroom. Okay, so based on the experience we have, uh, we are learning, um, first of all, is about our students, because again, back to the previous uh, few uh, presenters, we actually need to see them as individual, because every student is different, <laughs> especially for our student. There's so many research saying like uh, m most of our students are in uh, just the detention system actually have PD, uh, PTSD. So they are traumatized. How are we gonna treat them, like see, make them feel like they are important and then to empower themselves? And then also, like uh, when we ask them to respect others, at the same time, our staff also need to respect them. So that's very, very important to them. So when we are doing that, we create a safe environment. So when uh, we talk about, when we are discuss about the misbehavior, we won't take it personally. It's either for students or for us. Then um, also like we always need to check with the, the teacher to support them. Because we support a teacher, we always, we, means we support the, the, the school. And then from the, this top two, actually the most important key is to build up the relationships. Because you build up, uh, when you are care about the student, you build up the re relationship with them, then they can really get what you're talking. And then also like uh, when you build up the, uh, relationship with the with your staff then your staff are able to follow and then to really like uh, implement PBIS and also like we utilize the data just like what I say I send out the, the data um, week, on a weekly basis when I send it out then the team actually can decide okay they can find out like which student might need more support or which teachers really might need like uh, other trainings or something like uh, to help them doing uh, PBIS or, or uh, to help the students misbehavior. So we are utilize the data to tell us where we should move our resource to. And the last step is um, the, last, uh, the last one, but it's very important because I, here I only put like a teacher group or, and student group, but actually for us it's including everyone, all agencies in the facility, because we definitely need to bring uh, our probation on board, and then definitely need to bring our DMH on board, because more people actually uh, provide more, more resource for us. So this is our next step, and then, um, so for us, we definitely need to continue the training, and then uh, to create like a positive culture in the environment, and then uh, Scott, Camp Scott is gonna continue share the, uh, our experience and guide other, our other uh, legal sites. And uh, very important is like, um, this actually is our second year to have all the sites on board. So the communication and collaboration with probation and with DMH, we are just, um, we start and then we are a very important year, like um, you know, have the uh, breakthrough year because um, now we get the, our, um, the upper management from probation and DMH buy-in. So now we are trying to really build up one system for all. Instead of like uh, only schools, you know, making efforts and then, but not able to, uh, you know, push it to all uh, other agencies in the facility. And then after doing that, definitely we need to uh, expand the implementation to family and community because our student eventually is gonna go back to home, go back to the community, and go back to all of you. So like uh, we are trying to educate them and to teach them the skills and then to uh, for appropriate behavior. So when they are learning the skills and then they return to you, then uh, your, the, the family, the community, and even the schools can, can support them with the, um, continue to support them with the appropriate uh, environment to attend school. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy.
I visited Central Juvenile Hall the other day and I was greeted by two students and they said, hello, we are your PBIS ambassadors. It's just amazing. So I, I just really, my hat's off to them. But um, I wanted to discuss the Model SAR recognition program. We were fortunate today, we have three of the four Model SARs from this current year that are here today to share with us information. But they include Alhambra, Centinella Valley, Hacienda La Puente, and also Long Beach. Those are our four model SARs for this year. But we encourage your school districts to apply. It's a great way to recognize the good work that you're doing to bring focus to your SARB efforts. And some of the things that you need to show in the model SARB application is that you are rewarding good or improved attendance that you are providing early identification of attendance problems, and then finally that you have a solid SARB referral process. So we encourage everyone to use that as an opportunity to not only recognize your work, but to share it with others around you. I also wanted to mention this organization is, the, is called CASWA, the California Association of Supervisors of Child Welfare and Attendance. This organization works directly in promoting model SARP, but they also represent some of the experts throughout the state. We have meetings where we meet with other student support services or child welfare and attendance practitioners and we share information and we try to help one another to become better at what we do. And um, CASWA has a state conference coming up in Fresno in May. And so we encourage you to participate and get involved. Um, I will admit there's another one I like better in the fall. We have it here at Knott's Berry Farm, so I like that one. <laughs> so I hope you'll take the opportunity to get involved in, in these opportunities. And I would like to introduce you now to Tina Preciado from the Centinella Valley Union High School District, one of our model SARPs. And I don't know, colleagues, if you knew, I used to work at Lusinger High School, and um, my job, the Lusinger, they are called the Lusinger Olympians. So my job when I was vice principal was to carry the Olympic torch around the track. So I'll never forget that. <laughs> Kevin, thank you. Good morning and happy Friday. I am Tina Preshello. I am the Student Welfare Specialist in Sentinel Valley Union High School District. And I brought along Kevin Brown, who is our, so our district social worker. And we are very limited on time, so I'll probably speak very fast and cover a couple of things. One of, some of our best practices, I would say, that put us as a model SARP school is that we use the restorative practices during our SARP process. So looking at our, some of those, we did set up a Remind 101 for our parents for SARP as a way to communicate. That is just helping us increase the communication with our parents, with our community members, with our students as well. This right here is our motivations of absence. We felt that at, throughout the SARP process, this tended to be the most common reasons as to why our students did not come to school. Uh, I would say most of them tend to be that we have our parents working multiple jobs, so mom and dad are probably getting home anywhere between 6 and 7.30 in the morning, where kids should be at school. Mom and dad drop them off, think they're at school, kids are, I'm out of here, I'm gone. Another one that we're, finding we usually find out during the SAR process is the drug and alcohol use. Parents are not aware of that. Parents think they're giving money to the kids to buy lunch. We find out kids are taking drugs. As for the school part, some of our parents are aware that our kids are not going to school. And we get, well, they don't want to wake up in the morning. They kind of have a hard time doing things in the morning. There's issues going on. I get home and they're still asleep. We also see, um, and this is where Kevin comes in, our psychosomatic com um, complaints, the emotional disconnection. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so we see a lot of that 
a lot of students that don't want to come to school because uh, social anxiety, social phobia, they're uncomfortable. There's definitely some bullying, definitely uncomfortability. Just students that haven't really equipped themselves with the skills yet, the social skills to handle uh, these obstacles and challenges. And um, parents are sympathetic and probably empathetic and um, contribute to this problem, sometimes uh, blindly or just, um, just outright um, uh, directly where they will encourage and, and foster the student to be able to stay at home uh, because of the, of the, the kind of like the psychosomatic the students that's presenting with the stomach aches the student that's presenting with the headaches these things they're actual uh, physiological reactions to, to emotional stressors and whatnot so it's a very common problem we see a lot of that we saw it yesterday at our SAR panel again uh, underlying loss and trauma for uh, but what do we see we see stomach aches and headaches so uh, I know we kind of touched on it from the, the nurse perspective. Definitely want to be mindful of, of that interaction between the mind and the body. So considering that these tend to be some of the issues why our students don't show up, these are some of the things that we put on our SARB referral. So our RTI specialist will normally start the process at the site. So what we've done this year is those restorative practices, instead of them being implemented only at the SARB, hearing we are doing it at the sites earlier so when they have a SART meeting RTI specialists are being in a panel of, of community members whether it's a school counselor the parent um, social worker parent liaison and we are trying to address some of those issues during SART which then would help us start an SST process so by the time they see us at SART they have already checked off what are some of those issues we have encountered with the kids during SART to let you know that we have addressed them and there are certain interventions that we have used already before we are referring them to SART? Um, and I, very briefly here to best practices, before we would have a 30, 60, 90 check-in after the SART. We are now, once again, doing that at the site at the SART level. So we have a 30, 60, 90 day check-in once the students are SARTed. Because as the SAR, when they get referred, we want to make sure every single intervention has been provided to the students at the site. Because as we said, we want the students to remain at the site. We want our students to come to school, improve attendance, make that connection, um, come out <coughs> successful. So by the time they get to us, we then, as a panel, will listen to what's going on and determine what some other interventions we may implement before we decide that we might have an alternative placement for the students. Yeah, too many times the student and the family will be there and oh, the, the student needs glasses, or they've been homeless, and it's just being uncovered now. And we have a lot of resources at that SAR panel, which is a great opportunity, but could we have uncovered these things early on? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So the, the whole shift this, this, this year was to do that. Uh, w one of the things, real quick, is uh, we have Lawndale Elementary School District. I know there's some representatives from there as well here today. And uh, we, we've attempted to, to partner with Lawndale and with Hawthorne School District in order to um, really try to extend the interventions that are available for our community. Essentially, Sentinel Valley is only a high school district. We do not have elementary or middle school. And what that means is that we have our two main feeder schools, Hawthorne School District and Londo Elementary School District, and we really want to be aligned with what they're doing. So there's ongoing collaboration. Uh, even recently, myself being at one of the, the SAR uh, presentations for Hawthorne School District. So we work closely with one another, and, and this the whole prevention piece, and. The early intervention piece is key because where does it start? It starts in kindergarten, right? And, and it, just, it just increases and, and, uh, and worsens, unfortunately. Can we get to the intervention? Yes. Okay. Okay, so here's another slide we really wanted to focus on is the intervention. So these are some of the interventions that we like to implement during the SART process. We have the check-in, check-out, several conferences parent, student, teacher, a student, teacher, sometimes we throw in our social worker in there. We'll have restorative circles with students as well. Once again, those restorative practices. 
we do have A2A, which is a company that helps us generate these truancy letters. So we send out letters three, three times. Every time the kids are absent, it goes out automatically. So we're notifying them, calling the kids for SAR. We um, let the parents know. On our SAR panel, we have our district social workers. We also have a community member of the, what are they called? The mental outreach. Oh, yeah. <coughs> From um, the Children's, Children's Bureau. Bureau. Children's Bureau. Yeah. Children's yeah. Bureau. And so we have that capability to start referring our students out to, for mental health. We also provided on-site through the help of our social workers and the interns that we have. And, we, and that's a new service uh, this year. We started a social work student intern program. I know it was touched on that uh, Hamburg has over 100 interns. We have eight. We're starting this year. It's, it, we're really happy, and we've got a lot of support from our, our, our local neighboring district, Laundry Elementary School District. I'll just give them a plug again because they've been helpful in initiating our program. But that's the whole goal is like the students are there at school and it's a meaning, it's, a, it's an opportunity to really, to, to capture them and provide the service there because it was already mentioned, are they gonna drive the three miles? It doesn't seem far to us. We've gone many lengths for, for, our, for our graduate studies and all sorts of programs, right? But a family can't go three miles. So we wanna provide the services on site. And as I believe it was Dr. Thompson who has said earlier, when they came out to our district, they talked about how some of our administrators and counselors are mentoring certain students. We are looking at, we all know that our foster youth and our homeless youth, a vast majority of the time will have issues coming to school. So making sure that we provide the, that support and services for them will require some of us to take on that responsibility, which comes to that two by 10 mentoring. So we try to meet with the kids at least two times for about 10 minutes just to check in with them. As an educator for 20 years now in a different role, I often find myself being a teacher during SARB. And there are certain times where I make a connection with the student where I will tell them, sweetie, I have access to see all of your log entries. If I see anything that is wrong, I will personally go visit you at the site. Because I have the time to do that. Some of the kids are like, fine, no problem. Some of the kids look at me like, ooh, I heard about you. I don't want you coming to see me. <laughs> so there comes in the good cop, bad cop thing. I know some of you play this role at, at SARB and you can use it to your advantage. I'm not advocating for, for that. What I am advocating for sort is, is that we have to de deliver a message and we have to have someone who has, who's empathetic as well. And sometimes those are not the same people. There's two different people who can play two, two different necessary important roles. We will actually step out with a, with a student during a SARB hearing and say, oh God, that was, that was kind of brutal in there, right? It's kind of tough, kind of harsh. And they're like, yeah. And encourage them to, and empower them to really advocate for themselves because we want it to be restorative. And at the same time, we're talking about law. There's legal mandates. And uh, each person has a different tech, uh, kind of like a different technique, uh, tactic and technique to get to the students. It's really important to do that. We want to reach them. And at times, just making yourself relatable to the kids during that SAR is all that they need to open up and speak to you. Because now they're saying, okay, there's actually somebody there who wants to hear what I have to say. And there's not somebody there who's answering for me and I just become that bobblehead where I shake my head. And in our panel, that's what we all do. We want to hear from the students because when they come to us at SAR, this might be what happens to them where we have to place them in an other alternative environment because we're, all the interventions have happened and there's still no improvement. But on the flip side, we do have students who have improved. And that is when we celebrate their success, which will be in our, during our last SARB meeting. The last SARB meeting of the year, we want that to be a celebration of the students that have been referred to SARB and have shown improvement. Uh, we really want to just say thank you um, to an opportunity to present. We've been working on some new programs and this year has made uh, it's proven an opportunity for us to, to expand on what we did last year. Um,
person that was uh, vital in this SARB, in the model SARB application was Blaine Watson, and he's not with us uh, today. Uh, but he was a vital player in our district, and uh, we just want to extend a, gr a bit of gratitude to him and to everyone else at LACO. Thank you. So I'm going to invite up uh, Dr. Brianna Nix and Cynthia Cabello. But Cynthia also goes by Gomez on her email, so you'll see that as well. So. Yay. Hi, everyone. So uh, we're going to talk real fast, okay? Um, so thank you for having us. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Nix is an integral part of what we do with SARB. I kind of just am the puppet master. But I do have to say that this is, you know, this, I call it God's work, right? When I came aboard onto Student and Family Services or CWA World, um, approximately six years ago, I, you know, I came from the school side as a teacher and a principal and all of that good stuff. And um, I didn't know that I was going to fall in love with the work. It, it's just, it's really, really good work. And I was lucky enough to inherit an office that was on the right track. Back in 2006, we had a superintendent and we had student and family services director that knew that somehow kids needed to want to come to school that we needed to address that they couldn't learn and it was all about student achievement. And so we started getting all our training on PBIS and RTI and we're like, oh my God, we need to do belief surveys and we started doing those and then we're like, wait, we need to screen our students. We started doing universal screenings and it's now just part of the patchwork of what we do in HLPUSD. We do 100% of our students universal screenings um, looking to see if they're showing any ex um, any elements of either extrinsic or intrinsic um, factors that are, might be prohibiting them from learning. Um, and we started doing uh, curriculum, social emotional curriculum. So we really started looking at that holistic approach of what our students needed, whether it was um, knowing how to play early on or was it they, they, they have to share or was it an academic issue. Um, then about four years ago, we have a new superintendent and they were committed to, to this effort. We kept showing them the data that we needed more help, and we were lucky enough to hire 10 student support TOSAs, what we call them, so teachers on special assignments, and we intensively trained them on tier one strategies. What, what does it need to look like to create these positive um, role models in the classrooms? And they, would, they started coaching teachers, and then they started coaching students, and they started getting our um, uh, small groups, and we really pushed really hard on the social emotional learning curriculum. So then, in all of that, we started looking at attendance, and so we needed to justify how we pay for them. So we wanted to increase ADA, right? So they started working inherently with the SARB aspect of student and family services. It was a perfect marriage. Um, Dr. Nix came aboard. We've had about three to four um, S and date counselors that focus on attendance and she's been on here. So let me just tell you about Model SARB. It has been what I have been chasing. We applied twice over the last uh, uh, six years and we were just this shy of it. This year, last year when we applied, we finally got it. I said, okay, I could quit now. I got the Model SARB recognition for the district and we're all good to go. But it was just really important work because what we realized that our applications, the more we worked deeply in um, deeper into how do we work with students and how do we motivate and support families and the whole community, the deeper our application got, and that's, I think, inherently what ended up um, helping us become a model SARP. So we're very humbled about the work that we do, and, we, and, it's, and it takes a village. Um, we actually have our student support TOSIS here. Can you guys all raise your hands? They're, they're the boots. We call them boots on the ground. Um, and, um, and then inherently we also now have worked with a new department. We created a new division called Equity and Access and we have them here as well. So we have our coordinator, Martha Calderon, and we have our two TOSAs and our counselor, foster and homeless counselor here as well. So it's just, uh, an ama it's been an amazing journey of what we've, do what we've done. So part of our model, Sarb, and, and for the sake of time, we did have two focus goals. One, of course, reduce chronic absenteeism. Um, because we're all here, we kind of know what that means now. Woo, yeah, we're learning. And then also to increase uh, high school graduation. So how do we do that? Um, part of my job, well, one of my many ha hats that I wear at the district is to monitor habitual truance. And I do that with the help of our wonderful SSTOSAs. And I actually go ahead and I send out um, eight, six to eight week reports on who's truant, 
10, 10 times or more than 10, 10% 10 of, the, of, the, of the time. And I do that pretty much every six weeks, six to eight weeks. Uh, I also send out, um, I call them truancy reports. So um, whoever has, has a truancy letter to um, report from our ARIES system. If, I, if, you're, if that student's name is on the list, then they should have been started. If not, please get on it. Um, I also do, you can go ahead and switch it. Um, I also do um, SART presentations for parents. Um, believe it or not, I try to do it in English and Spanish with a lot of help, right? Woo! Because uh, that is a big part of our, our population. Okay, bueno, yes. Um, I also, uh, sometimes when we do have new administrators, um, I train them on the SARB and SARP process because if they don't know, we want to make sure that we integrate them into what HOP does, what Student and Family Services does, what our equity and access team um, do. Uh, we have awesome initiatives, attendance um, initiatives I'm in, which is usually in September, um, co uh, coincide with our attendance awareness month. Um, that's pretty, pretty much when we celebrate why kids should be in school. The trick is we want to get them there. Why? For CBED's day in October. So we get them used to coming to school. We are celebrating them. Yay, banners, here you go. Uh, nice incentives. And then that way um, we kind of create that, that, uh, that practice of coming to school. Because it starts in kindergarten, right? We find that a lot of parents are like, oh, you know, they can stay home. They're OK, little fever, cough, cough, here we go. And by the time they get to high school, they're not, we don't see them. So we really want to start early with how we incentivize coming to school. Um, one thing that is a little bit different than our Centinella friends is we actually start our process with student success teams um, because it's one of the, the integral, integral uh, things that we need to know what's going on with our students. So if we find that, I always use little Johnny, if little Johnny is, is having a difficult time, we, we rally around little Johnny to figure out what's going on. And it could be a behavioral issue, it could be attendance issue, it could be um, you know, maybe a bullying issue, whatever it is, or a class issue. And we want to make sure that we figure out what the issue is. That's why you see all the different people that sit on that panel, including the parents. And that way we identify the barriers. It could be cultural, could be you know, transportation, whatever it is. And we explain to them the impact, positive impact that family can have, and also the negative impact that family can have. Because some of our families are traumatic for the student, right? So through that SST team meeting, we are able to make those appropriate connections um, with the academic and also attendance supports. Um, yeah, and to add to that, that SST process, one of the things that we do in HLP is that we um, really use that approach to everything that we do, whether it's a discipline issue, an expulsion issue, an attendance issue, a health issue. We look at all the other means of corrections on the front end before we get to anything that has, that we have to switch something up. So we go through a, an exhaustive list of checklists, you know, have we made home visits? Do, do they have health? health care um, do they need a referral to an outside agency we right now we have about four to five um, MOUs with outside counseling uh, mental health agencies to make sure that we're connecting families and so we really want to make sure that we're connecting our families on the front end so by the time they get to my office or at my desk the first thing I look to see is like what did the school do on the front end before we want to um, do something to the student. So we, we're always on like, what do we do for the student and for the family, not to the student and to the family. So our SAR panel is really, really big and it can be a little intimidating, but it really is a catch-all because we have everybody there sitting there saying, okay, this is our, our last effort on what is the plan that we're gonna do. We're gonna sign referral forms right here, right now. We're gonna <laughs> implement um, you know, maybe a different placement of a, of a teacher, or is it a school site, or is it you know provide the transportation, or is it the counseling aspect right there and then? We have the nurses there too as well. Nurses because there. It is a it could be a health issue, and I always use the example. Oh, little Johnny has asthma. And this I have asthma as well. I will literally pull out my inhaler and say, Well, I'm here, here at work today with this medicine here. Do you have yours? Are you equipped at school? Let's go ahead and make that connection with your school nurse and make sure that um, if it's a nebulizer or what have you. Uh, we, we definitely utilize our chronic verification of, of illness form because some of those things do happen and we, we want to make sure that we are aware and you know, you, ooh, when you start mentioning forms that parents have to take to doctors, my oh my, little Johnny gets to school, right? Because they don't want you in their business. So, <laughs> yeah, our Ms. favorite line is if you don't want to talk to us, that's okay. We'll go away as soon as you come to school. Exactly. We go away. We, we fade into the bushes. We're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard about that, Dr. Hanks. Um, so, and one of the things that we've also done is create a consistency of practice. 
um, in not only in, at the school site, but for example, our school office managers, we created how do we keep attendance consistent with an, an office manager's guidebook on how to marry um, NCS, which is our network computer system department, with our school office manager practice, with how our student support TOSAs are top contacting families and working with students, so that that practice is consistent and we're able to support each other. Um, our favorite uh, at the very early on and over the summer, my favorite meeting was with actually uh, Ms. Gowan here and our chief of police and our very experienced school officer and myself and I believe Dr. Nix, were you in the room, right? And we were going round robin on school truancy. Do you remember that? And citations. Remember that? And on the phone, we were like, we were all over the phone and I had the chief and an officer and they're like, well, what do you mean we don't give a citation? Da, da, da. And so. Man, she was awesome. And I was like, we just kept repeating it and repeating it. They finally got the message. But what we did is we created an actual process and procedure and an explanation, especially to our high school principals. And so we just kept giving them the verbiage of what to say, giving them the verbiage of what to say, and that we can't cite students for truancy. We want them, you know, and there's like, well, not on a campus and not at home. And so we were like really specific, but it takes that grit and that boots on the ground to just kind of keep hitting at that shell so that there's an understanding of what the end goal is. And they're all on board. So, and then we had to go train all the officers in the police department. Um, and you weren't there for that. <laughs> but it was, they were fine. Um, we just, you know, keep the message clear and consistent. Clear and consistent. One thing we want to mention um, before we take our seats is at our SARP uh, meeting, when we do refer a student or a family, it's actually a family. So we will invite the siblings um, if they have poor attendance as well. And I, I actually am, am the one that will look um, at their records. And if I see the sibling that, that's doing well, you know, they maybe they're poorly in the beginning and now they're doing well, I, I won't invite them, you know, but I'll make sure I speak to the parent and I say, well, what are you doing with him or her that's allowing them to get to school? Maybe that student we find out is actually not staying with the family, they're staying with the aunt or something different. So, oh, okay. So what do we, can we do that with this other child? You know, what, what are we doing? Let's talk with the family to figure out um, the successes that are happening and then what can we do uh, to kind of make that better for all of their students? These are just some of the, the, er the areas that we've um, worked on to continue to provide to our students, um, our foster and homeless youth transportation, <coughs> Department of Mental Health. I've learned a lot just sitting in SARB from with these agencies on the services that they have that sometimes help me in a different aspect of the work that I'm doing. And so I know the resources to tap. Uh, parenting classes, uh, DCFS, and um, for example, Eyeglasses, Lions Club, having our nurses there. Um, one thing that we've, um, we're streamlining this year is having our um, district psychologist that assists us with behavior support. So we have had some SARBs where we have students, you know, under special ed with an active IEP. And so he's looking at it through a different lens. And so what we're doing now is if we get a SARB referral, a student with a SARB referral with an IEP, it goes through his eyes first to make sure that we haven't missed anything before we put the family in front of this big panel. So we want to once again make sure that we're checking off, did we miss something? Do they have a behavior support plan? Do they have a health plan already in there? Does that need to be adjusted before we're even going to consider it um, holding them accountable and then sending them over to um, uh, truancy mediation? Same thing as with uh, if we, we before we even get to SARB, if the student checks off the box of McKinney Vental or foster youth, did we did our equity and access team have a hand in the student's um, career? What what did the student the students um, admin at the site level, what have they done to help that student in that family? Um, it, before they even get to our desk, uh, did equity and access, did they already make that connection? If so, okay, and it's not working, then we go ahead and take, take them to SARB. If not, I, we will actually hold that student from SARB until they are able to do what they do at our awesome equity and access team um, because we don't want to SARB a case if, they, if it's a transportation issue or they don't have clothes or access to you know, healthcare, something like that. So we, we do everything in our power to make sure that all of our site-based interventions have been in place before they even get to us. Because by the time they get to us, oh, we're in it, right? And we need to make sure that though it's, it's not a punitive practice, we're still supporting but we want to make sure that we, the site has done everything that they could do in their power before they, they use all of the supports of the SARP. And we have seen the trend uh, change over the years. When I first came on board, it was like, well, why are we going to SARP? Nothing happens anyways. 
That was, that, that was I mean, to my face, principals telling me that. And I'm like, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it made it really, it, uh, it was a mission to make sure that if we were gonna hold this process, that it was gonna be meaningful and that we were gonna make a difference. And I can't stress enough data, keep your data. Because um, uh, I get a request for data all the time and they'll say, you know, how many, you know, referrals to mental health agencies? I go, Brianna, we just pull up our SARB report that we have to do, and it's right there. How many kids have we seen? What grade level? What's our chronic absentee rate? You know, um, what are the trends? Um, one of the things, you know, that it's, it's what we've seen as this big holistic approach to working with our students is we have seen a, a real reduction in office um, discipline referrals of our elementary school students. Um, I think by five, five or six percent over the last three years. Um, we've also seen a decline in our suspension rates. We're down to, you know, um, I can't think the, name, the, the number, but I think in the 500s of number of incidences. Um, and we're a district of 18,000, and our expulsion rate when I came in was about 52, 53 expulsion cases a year, and last year we had a record of 10. Um, we are up a little bit because there's, you know, every year is a little bit different, but longitudinally, I think all of these positive um, behavior interventions, RTI, support, SEL, mental health, attendance, counseling, all of it together is, has made a difference in the lives of all of our students and all of our families. I think that, that would end it. I, I can't thank enough uh, Dr. Nix here. You know, um, she does an amazing job, makes me look good, and we're all good. <laughs> thank you for having us, we really are humbled. Dr. Thompson, will you introduce us to the immigration? And this will be what we're wrapping up with. Again, thank you. That's better. Thank you, Dr. Nix and Cynthia, and also Jennifer Gowan from the District Attorney's Office who's here with us. We appreciate it so much. I'd like to introduce to you LACO's Coordinator of Immigration Relations, Michelle O'Neill. We are very, very pleased to have her at LACO and that LACO has taken on this initiative to support all of our students, and Michelle will now address you. Some of you know me already in the room. I see some familiar faces. I'm just gonna tell you like the meat and potatoes and then um, how to get a hold of me. Um, this is what I wanna share with you. So this, this study just came out two weeks ago. So even if you have heard me speak or present, this is brand new, unless you were at the Violence Prevention Symposium last week. Um, and this study uh, was conducted, 730 schools, 12 states across the US participated and this is to collect data in post-election, immigration enforcement, what's happening, how are schools impacted, what is the perception among educators. Uh, school staff uh, included that were interviewed, ed, uh, administrators, teachers, classified staff, et cetera, so it's very comprehensive. And this is what the findings were. 64% said this is negatively impacting our schools. 90% recognize social emotional concerns with students, with their immigrant students. 70% ac academic decline, and here you go. 68% in an uptick in absenteeism. And why? Because they're afraid to leave the house. Their parents are afraid to get them to school. Um, they're afraid to enroll in after school services. Free and reduced lunch is dropped, right? So this is really impacting us, regardless of our political viewpoint. These are our customers. And if we're not able to keep getting them into the door and supporting them, then we're in jeopardy too. So this is really, really concerning. Um, there's been an uptick as well with the bullying, uh, bias-related bullying and harassment. So that's another indicator of when students are not wanting to come because they're afraid to even be there because of the harassment that they're experiencing from their peers. Unfortunately, schools were largely impacted by that uptick in um, hate crimes and hate incidences that were happening. And we're seeing that and I'm hearing that um, straight from our sites and what they're getting back from their students. Um, and here's a link in the teeny tiny font if you're interested in accessing all of this report. But so we have a problem. Um, and this, what's happening with immigration and the enforcement and change in policies are directly impacting us as educators. Um, this is what we're seeing, drop in attendance and an increase in student discipline simply because of that uptick with the bullying and harassment of not only our immigrant students, also religious based uh, with our Muslim students as well and even anti-Semitic. We also have new, legis new legislation that just came out that's requiring all LEAs, all public school agencies to adopt 
uh, safe locations policy that keeps ice out of our schools and we must be compliant by July 1st. This is really gonna help. It shouldn't be a political issue anymore, right? If all of us have to adopt these policies saying we're not gonna work with ICE and share any student information, um, there is a caveat there, uh, but this is changing things and it's driving home the message to our students and our parents that you belong at school. We need you to be at school, you're re required by law to be at school and school is a safe place for you to be. So this is really huge. Um, so this is what we're seeing, we're unprepared. Uh, we have parents that are afraid to leave the house, we have, especially elementary, if they're not comfortable leaving, we're not gonna get our kids to school. Um, older kids are afraid to go, they're afraid they're gonna come home, mom and dad's not gonna be there and they're never gonna see them again. They're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. Um, with through so safe safe school policy so AB 699 again by July 1 we'll all have to be compliant LACO has an extensive robust policy that we created you can find that on my immigration website um, the Attorney General is going to publish model policies by April 1st and again we'll have by July 1 to either adopt those policies or create our own at LACO we already have ours and of course we'll revise it to match whatever that model policy is that for us at LACO means any school or any function related um, to LACO. So any building that we lease, any extracurricular activity, uh, after school care, preschool, uh, field trips, uh, on the way to school, uh, bus stops, et cetera. Um, here's what we need to do to support students. Let them know they belong at school, that we want them to be at school, that regardless of whatever is happening, that the one thing that no one can take away from them is their public education and that we're charged as public educators to ensure that their constitutional, federal, and state right to education free from uncertainty is intact. Uh, CTA has these awesome resources for free. You can download them, you can put them around your school site. That drives home the message. It helps to create welcoming <coughs> communities. Um, I highly recommend, this is just three of my favorites. Uh, share resources with parents. When you're having that SARB meeting and a parent shares with you that it's due to immigration concerns, let them know there's resources available and that they do have rights regardless of their status and they should know what they are. That first link gives you all kinds of different languages, know your rights. They have rights as a consumer, as a tenant, as a worker, and they need to know what those are. There are also supports through LA County that can provide them with support if they are having an issue um, as a tenant or as an employee. Um, that, that's all free services to them. California put forth $45 million recently to fund legal support and resources for both undocumented and legal residents around immigration. Uh, you can access these vetted services, share these with your families. Um, reputable vetted services, uh, they can help them with DACA, they are, cover the $495 for the uh, renewal fee, they can help them with, for TPS, those that have TPS, with any pathway to citizenship or, or, or a visa to find out. What we recommend is that they contact these agencies. They're all over LA County. They offer free immigration screenings, which means they can just pop down, fill out a little bit of paperwork confidentially and find out what they may be eligible for. And that's the only way we can get them moving forward. And often a lot of this will be, again, through that money will be covered and they will not have to pay a dime. So at least find out what they're eligible for. Here's where you're gonna find all kinds of information. If you go to LACO EDU, look for the green guy with the book and you click on him, that'll bring you to my website, which is all immigration resources. So that first one is for educators, for you guys. The second one is for you guys to look for resources that you can share with your students and families. And then the last one's on policy. So I mentioned LACO safe locations policy. If you're interested in looking at that or you can't sleep at night, this is a good section to look at here. That's all the boring dry stuff, right? but for some of you may be interested. All the good juicy stuff is over here. Um, you can also follow me on social media. I'm always sharing resources and updates on what's going on with legislation, what's happening in the news, so I recommend following me. It comes right to you. Uh, and these are some of the things you can find. It's in your, in, in your handout. Okay, that's it. that's it. So my contact information, if you go to the website, all of that will be available. My email, my phone number. I'm happy to come out and speak to your parents to your school staff. If you have a, you need a consultation about anything related to immigration uh, attendance or, or otherwise, please feel free to reach out. I'm here to support you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm gonna actually play the videos for those.
not even my closest friends know. I know that I shouldn't really care about what Facebook comments and YouTube comments say, but I feel very shameful. I'm Mexican, I'm double majoring, I'm going to graduate magna cum laude. I didn't take out any loans either, I, I worked since I was 16. I can't hide it for the rest of my life. Right about 17, 18, that's when I got into Harvard, I received my acceptance letter. I left out the door and I tripped uh, on some cable there. It actually knocked down my computer. But I ran all the way to school to show them, you know, the email that I had just got. And that was the first problem there. A thing that drives me is when people ask me, so, what's your major? Yeah. Mathematics and statistics. Ooh, good luck with that. That looks confusing, but it's really not. So I went and I asked her, I was like, Mom, do you have my social security number? And she was like, you don't have a social security number. So I was like, wait, what? So how am I in school? And she was like, um, when I enrolled you in school originally, they didn't ask for a social security number. They just asked for your basic information and your birth certificate. I was like, wow, I don't have a social security number. That means I'm undocumented. A lot of these kids had no choice about whether they would come here. They found themselves in the United States at the age of two or three. The only country they know is our country. I came when I was about five. They did not take that first step. They did not decide to come to this country. How does a five-year-old get held responsible for a criminal act? When a student like that walks into your office and she says to you, so how do I get my driver's license, sir? And you have to be the one that says, man, I really have to tell you, there's no way that you can get your driver's license right now. And if you're driving down the street and you get pulled over, you could find yourself in a deportation hearing. As a counselor, that is the hardest conversation to have with a student, that she can't get a driver's license to go to work, that when she gets to go to work, um, she has to admit that she's undocumented. I missed the stop sign, and there happened to be a cop coming my way when I ran it, and he immediately turned around and stopped me. And that's where everything started. It was weird. I, I didn't feel myself fitting into the crowd. When they would ask me, what are you in for? I'm like, um, I had two traffic tickets. I was well behaved. Uh, I'd never been in any trouble. And that was my darkest hour, just being taken away and, you know, just the shame of being in handcuffs. I was arrested and even though I was innocent, I was transferred to an immigration facility and I was there for 45 days. The only thing I could see was a little TV outside of my cell. I just wanted to sleep. That's all I wanted to do. Like, I would wake up for breakfast, grab the food, give it away, and, and go back to sleep. Me being like in the whole orange jumpsuit thing, and to see my mom just on the other side of that glass, it just hurt for her, like, to see her cry, and me not be able to hold her and tell her that it was gonna be okay. Like, that, that hurt. My ancestors have been where Mario is right now. This sense of walking in fear and living in fear. If you treat these young people who live their whole life, except maybe a year or two, in the United States, and you reject them, and you make them go back to a country they don't know, you take them out of a culture that they love and they contribute to through their education, through being in the service. Well, it's a mystery how a Christian who says, I am a Christian, can be so harsh. What's the great secret in America, huh? The one we all know. We see Maria making our bed as we're getting to the hotel room. We don't give a hoot whether she has paper. She's made our bed, and we're happy she's there. It's shameful. This idea that people are walking around in fear, it just strikes me as, as un-American. It also strikes me as a problem that we should work to find a solution to. The President of the United States can single-handedly make sure that every dream kid in this country has a work permit tomorrow, has a driver's license tomorrow. He can't legalize them, he can't make them permanent residents, but he can give them a work permit. They've gone to school, they've worked hard, they've gone to college. Kids 
who've done everything we've asked of them. Let's give them that chance. This issue really challenges our country to look inside of our hearts. As sad as it is to see a dysfunction around our whole immigration issue, uh, even sadder would be if no one in the rest of the world wanted to come to America. I am so many things, and if people see me walking, if people were to see, you know, all the things that I've done, they would have never thought that I wasn't documented. I grew up in the United States. 16 years I've been here. I do want to stay. I first got involved with SARB in the fourth grade. Um, my brothers were also on the SARB list, and so was my sister. Um, my parents went through plenty of meetings with my brothers, my sister, and with me. Um, I remember specifically going into the room, and they were just talking with my parents about how I missed so much school and that they don't know what they're gonna do and stuff like that. So it really scared me, because I was like, I don't want my parents to feel like it's their fault. So that's what really kind of changed my mind about school. And in the second grade, I qualified for special education and they would always take me out of class and test me on certain things. and. I was the only kid that would go out of class and the, all the kids knew like why I was leaving class. So I remember just wanting to miss every single day of school, not even wanting to you know, attend class because I was like, they're gonna call me out and I knew the specific time. So I would just try not to even attend class. And in the eighth grade, I made a decision to really dedicate myself to school. I knew that, you know, I was going to high school, college was coming up soon, and my goal was to be the first one in my family to attend a university. And that time, I was like, okay, I need to turn something around. I need to, you know, focus more on my studies and just push through. And all throughout high school, it was, the best because I was always on time, always in class. I knew the material. I wasn't so far behind. I worked really, really hard to get to, you know, graduation and I graduated with honors. So that made my parents very proud. They knew that, you know, it wasn't just like that. I wasn't going to just allow that label to stick with me. I knew that I had to push and I had to just work really hard. And so after graduation, after graduating from high school, I will be attending California Baptist University where I will major in early childhood studies and I hope to pursue my dreams in helping young children in you know, the education system and telling them or showing them that it's you know, gonna be okay and that they can get through any obstacle in their life and that education is so important. And yeah, that their dreams can come true if they work really hard. Thank you for your full morning and your full attention. So thank you this morning.